Free Chat. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist today and we'll be talking with another doctor, Dr. Horowitz, that nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. Um, if y'all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. So super excited today. We've got uh, Dr. Mark Horowitz, who's an expert on depression, um, was one of the authors on a very, very instrumental paper that came out uh, maybe within the last year in molecular psychiatry about how the serotonin hypothesis of depression may not be valid, um, so that there's like a serotonin deficiency. We'll hear from him in, in a little bit. So we're going to hop into the interview in a minute. But we have a couple of announcements. So a couple days ago, we announced that we're doing a workshop on trauma. And it turns out that we are full. So it, it took us about eight or nine hours to maybe sell 80% of the, sp of the spots. Um, and so I, I guess we didn't realize that the demand would be so high for this kind of thing. But it seems like it's really, really helpful. And a lot of people are interested. So you can still use the command exclamation point trauma um, and still sign up for a wait list. I think we're going to probably try to do a second round or something like that. I don't know exactly what's going on. But if y'all, you know, didn't, weren't able to secure a spot, that's okay. We're going to try to figure something out. It's the first time that we're running a workshop like this. So we're going to try to figure it out. I think we're definitely going to do the workshop first and make sure it's actually helpful to people and that people really like it and it's it's worth the time and energy. Um, and if y'all missed the boat, sorry about that. We're working on it. Thank you to everyone who's who's signed up already. We really, really hope that we will make it worth your while. So second thing is uh, we've been full on coaching for a couple months, but we finally got group co coaching spots available. So if y'all are interested in sort of like leveling up the skills that have to do with um, if you kind of fallen behind in life and don't really know how to find motivation or don't really know how to be vulnerable or form social connections, group is actually fantastic for that. So definitely check those out. And without further ado, we're going to hop in with Dr. Horowitz. Um, all right, Mark, we're going to go live here in a second, okay? Or we, sure. we're, we're live. One second. There we go. Can you just count to 10 for me? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, Perfect. six. All right. So welcome, Dr. Horowitz. Thanks for having me on here. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Um, so let's just start by, can you uh, t tell me what, what you prefer to go by, uh, how you like to be addressed? You, you can call me Mark. That's okay. fine. And Mark, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what your area of expertise is? So at the, so I'm a, I'm a training psychiatrist. I do some of my training in Australia and some in England. Most of the time I'm doing research at the moment. I'm a clinical research fellow in the National Health System in England, and I'm an honorary research fellow at University College London. Uh, I run a deprescribing clinic in my public hospital uh, in London, where we help people to safely stop antidepressants, benzodiazepines, Z drugs, uh, and similar uh, drugs with people that have anxiety, depression, or insomnia as their diagnoses. Uh, a lot of my research is in withdrawal effects from psychiatric drugs and how to more safely stop them uh, with a particular focus on antidepressants. Uh, I came to this work because um, I had a very difficult time stopping antidepressants and other psychiatric drugs. Uh, and I had never been taught about it in my training, either in medical school or in psychiatry training. And so when I experienced it firsthand, uh, one, it was the most awful thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Uh, I hadn't had any warning of it from, from um, my lectures and my learning. And that really got my attention, especially when I realized that there were a lot of other people around the world having similar issues. And so my entire research and clinical practice has now focused on uh, how to safely stop these drugs. And also that's led to a reappraisal of how effective they are what their long-term effects are uh, and what alternatives uh, there are. And I, just to give you a, a brief summary, I've, I've worked on a project the last few years on stopping antipsychotics in people with psychotic disorders, as well as one of the clinic that I've mentioned. And I've also started um, a company called Outro Health, which does a lot of the work that I do in the public health system uh, in the private uh, world, uh, which will open in America next year 
to help people to safely stop antidepressants to start with. Awesome. So can you, uh, are you comfortable sharing uh, your, like some of your personal experience about sort of stopping antidepressants and what that was like for you? Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll go right back to the beginning um, because, you know, I know whoever's in your audience, at least one in six of them will be on an antidepressant uh, because that's the stats for anywhere in the Western world, in, in America, in the UK, in Australia. Um, so like, uh, like lots of people, uh, I went through a period of, of very low mood when I was in my early twenties. Uh, I like to say I'm the, I'm the, I'm a sort of character from a Woody Allen film. I'm a, I'm a neurotic, pessimistic, ruminatory kind of bloke. That's just my, that's just my makeup. Uh, I wasn't particularly happy about my course. I was, uh, doing medical school. I had, I had a variety of different interests. I felt it was very narrow. Um, and I, I had a variety of things happen to me growing up. Uh, anyway, that led me to the door of my GP at 21, uh, who, after a few minutes, gave me an antidepressant, like like a lot of people, uh, like half the world almost these days. Uh, anyway, I tried a few different antidepressants. I ended up on Lexapro or Escitalopram, and I took that drug for about 15 years before uh, e even thinking about stopping it. I had this sense it was good, you know, it was something useful. People like me should take a drug like that. Can I um, jump in for a second? Please go for D it. Did you find that it helped you? I find that question very hard because to, to answer, because when I started it, I had lots of side effects. It made me feel, um, it gave me a funny yawning sensation. It made me feel a bit dizzy. Uh, it made me, it gave me a sense. Um, I was a bit intoxicated. I felt things felt a bit different. They looked a bit different. The first drug I was given, which I can't remember which one it was, it was an SSRI of some sort. I went back, got another one. That also had side effects. I went back a third time and that had side effects. But by that point, I sort of thought, oh, I've been around this. I'll just stick with this one. They're all imperfect. Uh, so the question of whether it actually improved things for me, I don't know. Because I spent months kind of going back in and out. I just had this idea from, I guess, from medical school, from people around me, that it was a helpful drug. So I just sort of thought, look, I probably should take this. I see. Um, yeah. And and do yeah. you know if, like, when you were taking the medicine, people used things like standardized instruments to measure your progress or, or things like that, like the HAMD or back depression inventory or anything like that? No, 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 no. I wasn't given any of those. Uh, okay. Those yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I kept getting refills, I think every three months and every six months and every year. Um, and I kept, I kept taking it. Um, then I did, I went, I moved from Australia where I was born, uh, to London uh, where I did a PhD in the neurobiology of depression and how, and how antidepressants work for, for obvious, obvious reasons. I was trying to solve my problems and those are my, <laughs> my family, the usual way, um, and I did a PhD. It was quite a successful PhD in lots of ways. Worked hard for a few years. Towards the end of that degree, I came across an article talking about withdrawal effects from antidepressants. And I found that a very startling article because I'd never heard about that before. I'd never mm -hmm. heard you could have withdrawal effects. I knew you could have withdrawal effects from benzodiazepines and from opioids. And I guess it got my attention because I thought drugs that cause withdrawal effects are drugs that you become dependent on, you become tolerant to, and they're generally not very good for you in the long term. But I've been walking around on this supposition that antidepressants were, you know, as safe as chips, you know, and, and hearing that they had withdrawal symptoms, you know, sort of shook me out of that. And I thought, well, maybe I should try stopping them. I've been on them for so many years. Um, and I did what every every uh, diligent PhD student does. I read every paper in the in the area, mostly some of them by the professors I was working with. Uh, I was working at the Institute of Psychiatry in London at that point in time. And they all said uh, discontinuation symptoms from antidepressants are mild and brief. Uh, you can stop the drugs in a few weeks and there's not major issues. You can halve them, then halve them again, and you're off. And I thought, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. Then, although I'm, I'm a kind of geriatric millennial, I'm still in that group. So I also went on the internet to see what, what did the internet say? 
And the internet gave me a very different story. It said, these drugs can be really hard to come off. It can take people months or years and people can have a really horrific time doing it. And I sort of thought, uh, I'm not sure who to trust here. I'm a pretty institutionalized person. I spent my entire life. Can, can I well, jump in for a second, Mark? So when, yes, when yes. you were saying that, you know, people were saying that you can have them and have them again. So the, the, you went to the internet, but where was your source of information for the idea that SSRIs are, generally speaking, easy to come off of? So, so the easier to come off of was from academic articles and guidelines okay. uh, written by professors. So okay. that was, yeah, that was, some of them had- So, so not in, like pharmaceutical companies, like this is like academic medicine that was sort of saying this. Well, they're, they're the same. I mean, okay. I mean, they were, a lot of these, a lot of the academics, well, they were giving a similar, they were giving a similar story, you know, on the, on the patient information leaflets of drugs, they say you can stop in a few weeks. And that story was echoed or was similar from academics who were writing, uh, you know, discontinuation symptoms are, are mild and brief and you can stop them in a few weeks. Uh, there was an article which summarized all the major guidance written by, written by pharmacy academics that said that exactly Harvard and Harvard again is the kind of uh, rule of thumb in the, in the field. And it still, still is. Can I ask you a little bit about what you mean by pharmacy academics? Oh, sorry. It was. I can give you a specific paper. I can't remember. It was a 2013 paper. It was a independent pharmacist. I don't mean. I don't mean drug company academics. Uh, a couple of academics, I think Americans, who went through all the different national guidelines to summarize what what the guidance was, and basically it was half the drug for a couple of weeks, half it again for a couple I of see. weeks. So, so these are these are not pharmaceutical company academics these are academics that fo focus on pharmacology and what exactly. they had done is synthesize the guidelines so they'd sort of done like a meta-analysis or something like that of guidelines from different places and what's what's your understanding of how those guidelines are formed so i can tell you a lot more about that um so let me so i'll just i'll tell you a, so i'll give you some specifics so that i'm not talking uh, in general yeah that'd be great so, um up until, so I'll talk about the UK and America. I guess a lot of your audience would be American, but the UK is what I know the most. In the UK, up until 2019, when things were changed, actually maybe even the last couple of years, 2022, the guidelines said antidepressants can be stopped over about four weeks, but some people may need longer. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that was the entire guidance, so a little bit vague, but the number there is four weeks. Uh, we know in practice that's what most doctors do because we've surveyed hundreds of patients and that is what, what people do. Uh, in America at the moment, the American Psychiatric Association guidelines for depression, off the top of my head, I think the, the, the words they use is antidepressants can be stopped over a few weeks, uh, but, it may, but it may be harder for drugs like paroxetine. I think that's what it, what it says, something like that. Similar in Canada. And that's present, that's present day. That's the current guidelines in America and Canada. In England, there's been a shift, but I'll save that for when we get there in the story. Where do those guidelines come from? I know exactly where it came from in the UK because there was a freedom of, of information request made to the writers of, of the guidelines, and it came from the following. There is a study conducted by the manufacturer of fluoxetine, which stopped antidepressants abruptly and followed up withdrawal symptoms for a week. And that showed a very high rate of withdrawal symptoms from, from different drugs for paroxetine, 80% for sertraline, 60%. That was, and, and based on that study, the guideline writers in the 1990s, I think, or 2000 said, that's too fast. Stopping abruptly is too fast. And they came up with a number of four weeks by consensus. So the committee sat around and said, we think four weeks is about right. I see. So that wasn't based on data. They just, they had a, a piece of data that said, sudden stopping is too fast so let's yeah. pick a number and we, we're just kind of assuming that that won't induce withdrawal exactly that's exactly it so it, it was what would be called expert consensus and not based on any empirical studies okay thanks um, for sharing that that's okay i'll just add to that um because the guidelines also said and this is a really important point and i'm glad you're getting into the specifics the guidelines also say they still say it in america they did say in the uk they've now been adjusted to say discontinuation symptoms from antidepressants are brief and self-limiting over about a week so 
uh, so no, mild and self-limiting over a week, mild in severity and uh, and brief. With the, with the proviso, sometimes they can be more severe, especially if the drugs are stopped abruptly. So those those that phrase, mild and self-limiting, mild and self-limiting, is in every guideline. It's in America. It's in Canada. It's in Australia. It's in the UK. That phrase, mild and self-limiting, uh, emanates from different papers put out by a drug company uh, meeting organized in the 1990s. That meeting was uh, organized because there were starting to be reports of withdrawal effects from antidepressants. And we know that the market for benzodiazepines outside of America was ruined by withdrawal effects. People were getting dependent and tolerant. It was causing a lot of bad press. They wanted to make sure that that didn't happen for antidepressants. I, I would think that's their motivation because they convened a group of academics, British and American, and they coined the phrase discontinuation symptoms to replace the scarier sounding withdrawal symptoms, but the accurate term. And they, they, they wrote six different academic papers with fancy authors from uh, Harvard and Stanford and, and, and different uh, Ivy League uh, universities saying that antidepressants antidepressant discontinuation effects were mild and self-limiting and they were and they printed off those papers and they circulated them to american and british doctors and that that entered the lexicon so i'm, I'm curious when you say like there were people from harvard and stanford involved can you say more about that sure i can i can i can uh, show you the papers. so uh one of the papers was written by um rosenbaum who i believe was at harvard at that time uh, one of the papers was written by Alan Young, who was at the Institute of Psychiatry, the equivalent, an Ivy League equivalent university in uh, in England. Um, and in these papers, they talked about people who had come off antidepressants. So you smiled. It sounds like you recognize that person. He's at the end of his career. Um, he was he was featured in a documentary broadcast on the BBC a few weeks ago. Uh, he talked about even writing that in a paper led to him receiving pushback from his colleagues although that was a paper that was paid for by by drug companies. Um, well, I'm sorry, what was in the paper? So the, in the paper, it was a description of discontinuation symptoms from antidepressants in which they were described as, as mostly mild and self-limiting. Uh, and I, and, and that, that data was based on short-term use. So the classic trial for antidepressants, you might be aware, is you spend six to eight weeks on the drug uh, and that's that's the trial. That's what they publish. In some of those trials, they stopped antidepressants, and they found that in people that stopped antidepressants after six to eight weeks, most symptoms were uh, mild and self-limiting. So not all of them. Let, let me jump in for a second. So what we're sort of saying is that there's a paper, and just for full disclosure, uh, Jerry Rosenbaum was one of my psychopharm mentors. Um, right. So I, I trained at his institution, and he was chief of psychiatry at the hospital that. Um, I, I, and I think that's totally fine. I think Jerry would actually love this conversation. I think part of what he taught me is to really question this kind of stuff. And even in terms of our psychoform mentorship, he taught me a lot of stuff that was outside of the guidelines. Um, and it's actually partially because of his training that I'm loving to talk to you now. Uh, but if there's some kind of bias there, you know, I'm sort of sharing it and then we'll see. But well, I just want to make sure I understand you. So it sounds like the, the data that... SSRIs have mild withdrawal symptoms and are self-limiting come from studies where we're using SSRIs for a short period of time. And the picture is different. I'm guessing we're going to hear this. The picture is going to be different if you've been on it for 15 years versus eight weeks. And that those two things will result in a, a differential profile of withdrawal symptoms. But please keep going. You've, you've, you've got it exactly. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, uh, Exactly. So they, they said things that were true. It is true that after six to eight weeks, most symptoms are mild and self-limiting. It's not, I should just, I should point out that just taking an example, uh, in some of those patients, it wasn't mild symptoms. So for example, taking venlafaxine, Effexor, very common usage drug in America, after eight weeks, uh, I think 4% of people had very severe withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and that's that is that is rated by the manufacturer of the drug. So it's it's a it's a it's a drug company study. In other words, just after eight weeks, some people, not not a huge amount, but a, a sizable proportion, one in twenty-five, are having very severe effects. Um, 
but the, the major point you've already got is exactly these are short term studies. The reason why people have withdrawal effects from drugs is because the brain adapts to a drug. It gets used to it. That's what the process of dependence or physical dependence is. And, and that causes tolerance. When you stop the drug, you get withdrawal. And of course, people that have been smoking for six weeks have less withdrawal effects than people who have been smoking for 10 years. And the data now shows that for antidepressants. If you've been in, using antidepressants for less than six months, there's a much lower risk of withdrawal than if you've been using them for three years. In fact, there's kind of a, not quite linear, but but kind of there's a ceiling effect. Can, can I, I, can I jump in again? So sure. and are you okay with interruptions and questions along the way? Please, please I'm, okay. I'm by. So uh, I've got a question, a uh, couple questions for you. So I've had patients that I prescribed SSRIs to. And um, just to give you some context, so a, a lot of people actually come to me to come off of medication as well. So my area of interest, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but um, is pr primarily actually complementary and alternative medicine. So evidence-based complementary. And then I started this whole YouTube Twitch thing and, and sort of focus on technology addiction now. But I, I spent a long time in sort of my research areas and, and sort of what landed me at Mass General was that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I would frequently get patients who want to actually come off of medication and we're really interested in sort of like holistic perspectives. And I would sort of add evidence-based complementary alternative medicine. And uh, I found that it was quite effective. So I'd say that like 80% of people in my practice would be would be not taking any medications by the time that we're kind of done. Um, I did, however, see, you know, a portion of people who, if we tried to pull them off of their SSRI, I would assess them for SSRI withdrawal. Um and and the the thing that was kind of confusing was I, I would see this pattern quite often. This was with some patients, and I'm just really curious what you think about this. They wouldn't have withdrawal, so they would actually I would uh, taper it off slowly over time, and we'd sort of see if there's emerging withdrawal symptoms. So I, I don't know that I followed like a four week kind of thing. It's like let's cut down your dose and see what happens and whether you feel anything or not. They'd actually come completely off of the the SSRI, um, and I think probably part of the way that I did that is based on some of these like withdrawal papers and other primary evidence as opposed to guidelines of discontinuation of SSRIs. But let's say in around six months or so, they would get a recurrence of whatever their depression was. What's your understanding of why something like, and then if we restart the SSRI, their symptoms improve. So what I'm kind of curious about is like, what do you think is going on there? So, so I'm going to take a step back and for some of the things that you've said, um, what a lot of people think is slowly when it comes to tapering is not as slow as, as you need. What a lot of people assume is not withdrawal is, is not so clear cut. So let me just take a couple of steps back maybe and talk about that. Um, it's really interesting to hear about your practice. It sounds, it sounds very interesting. It sounds like you're doing a lot of good work in this area. Um, so I said that the guidelines said to come off over four weeks. So that, that doesn't, that's not, it no longer says that in the UK because there's been a very big, I'm not sure which papers you're looking at, um, but there's been a very big change in, in, in guidance and practice in the UK. And that comes from an understanding of how um, antidepressants affect the brain and what's, a, what's the most effective way to stop these drugs. And, and very briefly, um, there's now some observational studies, there's some theoretical studies, and there's starting to be randomized controlled trials with the following, and, and this is what the guidelines from the Royal College of Psychiatrists now say in England, and also what the NICE guidelines say, which which guide uh, treatment now for, for all doctors. They say three things. They say one, that antidepressants should be tapered gradually, and gradually means months and sometimes years, not weeks, for people that are long-term users, number one. Number two, that the rate should be adjusted to the individual, and that if there are withdrawal symptoms, uh, you should pause, go back, go slower, adjust things. And number three, for the, for the final few milligrams, you need to go a lot slower. And that's because, something I can talk about a little bit more, the hyperbolic pattern of relationship between the dose of an antidepressant and its effect on the brain. So that very small doses have large effects. It means you've got to go down by, by slower and slower things. At some point, I can inflict on your audience a graph to show what I'm talking about. But yeah, I'll let remember. me just jump in. And, and so, so if we sort of think about this principle of diminishing returns, right? So generally speaking, if we look at SSRI dosing or just any medication dosing, there's diminishing returns. So taking, let's say, 10 times as much of the medication doesn't give you 10 times the effect for most medications. And so what you're kind of referring to is if you sort of think about it, there's the biggest effect from the smallest dose. 
And the higher and higher we go, the less of an effect that we get. And so what you're sort of saying is that since the smallest amount actually gives you the largest percentage effect, that last bit of tapering should actually be the slowest because that's when we're going to induce the highest level of withdrawal. Did I understand that correctly? You, you nailed it. Okay, perfect. So keep going. Uh, can I show a graph to emphasize how small sure. a dose actually has, has that effect? Because I think people, you know, what you're describing is um, uh, the, oh, let me just do this. What you're describing is the law of mass action, essentially, that very small doses have large effects when there's no other drug around because every receptor is available. So here's an example uh, for citalopram. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, citalopram is a very common antidepressant. Uh, this is effect on the serotonin transporter. Oh, but you can really think of it as effect on the brain. And exactly like you've just described, it's a law of diminishing returns. You've said it exactly right. The most common dose prescribed is either 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams. It's these tiny doses that have large effects. So for example, two milligrams will actually have half of the effect of 20 milligrams. This graph is based on nuclear imaging of the drug in people's brains, but it's also reflected in clinical effects. If you look at effects on symptom scores or effects uh, on adverse effects or side effects, it follows the same path. <laughs> it seems to have relevance. I'm laughing because um, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum said something to our class once that everyone was very surprised about. And he said, using sub-therapeutic doses of medication yeah. can sometimes be very effective. And we were so all I, very confused by that because we had been taught in the guidelines, right? That citalopram has a minimum yeah. um, sort of so, like effective dose or any SSRI. But yes. in his clinical experience, he was like, sometimes you can actually get a lot with sub-therapeutic doses. And we were confused because we use the word sub-therapeutic in our system, which yeah. suggests that it is not sufficient to get some kind of value. Yeah, so remember, you gotta remember what the word therapeutic means, where it comes from. Therapeutic means that a drug company has paid for the marketing authorization for a specific dose for a specific indication. So when you go to the FDA, you can't just say, I wanna market citalopram. You, you have to say, I wanna market citalopram at 20 milligrams for major depressive disorder. And then you do studies on 20 milligrams. So the reason why you think 20 milligrams is therapeutic is because that's what the FDA has approved the manufacturer's telegram yep. to, to sell. So it, it is kind of, it's not a chemical meaning, it's kind of, uh, you know, a financial or economic or a bureaucratic meaning. Um, well, and you can see, it, you I, can see I, it. I don't know if I, I mean, what about a clinical meaning? Well, we, we, can, we can get into what the clinical effects of antidepressants are in more detail. And I, and I that's probably a longer conversation. But yes, the, 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 the FDA would say, um, 20 milligrams shows a statistically significant difference from placebo, and that's why it's defined as therapeutic. Yeah, right. So if I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, designing a, a drug trial myself, I would want to yes. pick a dose that is yeah. on the higher end of your curve because that would make it more, that would make it an effective dose for more people on average. Right? Yeah. I mean, so drug companies do look at these kind of graphs and they do make decisions based on things you've just said. They, they, they're thinking also, we don't want to go too high up on the curve because that might cause more side effects. So right. That's, that's sort of so I, I think it, it makes perfect sense if you're sort of thinking about, you know, as side effects kind of increase, generally speaking, I want to say like linearly, maybe I'm wrong there. But I, I think if you're sort of looking at where's the sweet spot that will help the most number of people, I could totally see why even looking at this graph, you would pick... 20 milligrams, right? Because sure. that's where you get 80% saturation of whatever. So the drug is really working a lot. And after that point, you start to get diminishing returns. Yeah, yes, you can make an argument like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, something like that. And you can sort of see also why maybe using higher doses wouldn't add a whole lot more. Exactly. When people start to, when people start to increase the dose, it's often more about the clinician's desperation to do something rather than any any firm science. And I, and I agree on this with... Uh, Professor Rosenbaum, that smaller doses may have almost as big effects as, as larger doses. So I think there's good good reason to believe that. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Hortz, can, can we actually take even a further step back? Yes. Um, and and you don't, if you're done sort of sh uh, screen sharing, we can oh, I was going to show, I was going to show, I was oh, going to show okay. a bit more of what, what goes on here. So the most common, the most common approach to stopping antidepressants is to halve it and then halve it again. So mm. 20 milligrams of telepram, you'd go to 10. You can see there's a small reduction in effect on the brain. Some people get some withdrawal symptoms. If you go from 10 to five, a little bit more, 
if you go from five to zero, which sounds like a very small dose, actually what you're doing is throwing people off a cliff that they can't see. And people often end up in a screaming mess at that point. At that point, a lot of doctors will see what they think is relapse. The fact that someone needs the drug because they're coming in saying, I can't sleep. I'm having panic attacks. I feel anxious. And they're often put back on the drug and told that they need it. But if you approach this in a more rational way, you can see it would make more sense. What I've done here is drawn horizontal lines rather than the vertical lines before that are equally spaced. So equal reductions of effect on the brain require a slightly more peculiar pattern of reductions. These reductions will get smaller and smaller and go down to very tiny final doses. So you can see that so that this final reduction causes the same size in uh, change in effect on the brain. You need a very tiny dose, less than one milligram, in order that this is a, these are evenly spread out reductions. And it's interesting, and, and you could, for some people, these reductions may be even too big. You need to have intermediate between these. What is really interesting is over 25 years on the internet in peer-led forums, patients have worked this pattern out by trial and error. And this is what they recommend. Uh, and and you, may, you may or may not be aware that there are hundreds of thousands of people currently on peer support websites getting advice on how to come off these drugs and and what and the solution they've worked out follows this exactly that's super cool so um l let me ask you just like let's take a step back so uh, you uh, you had a paper in molecular psychiatry that i absolutely loved um that sort of was a i think it was a meta analysis of meta analyses about the serotonin hypothesis of depression so can we just start with what do you think causes actually let me ask one last question about that other thing, and then I want to take a step back. So in the case of someone who tapers off of, let's say, within a month, and they don't experience any withdrawal symptoms, and then their depression comes back, comes back, quote unquote, in six months, do you think that that is a resurgence of whatever the underlying pathology of depression is? Or do you think that is more tied to withdrawal in a different way? So so, so let me, sorry, I didn't get into that before. Let me get, let me get into withdrawal symptoms. So... Uh, withdrawal symptoms, what are, so what are they? They're there because your brain's used to a higher dose of the drug. You reduce the dose of the drug, your, drug, your, brain, your brain misses the drug, you get withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms can be either physical or psychological. I feel like the physical symptoms get more on the, uh, get more attention, dizziness, headache, brain sure. zaps. You know, they're, they're, they're much harder to distinguish. So they're easier to distinguish from anxiety and depression because they're very different, although often they get missed because no one asks about them. But the most common withdrawal symptoms are psychological, low mood, anxiety, panic attacks, crying, trouble sleeping, becoming suicidal. How do we know that those are withdrawal effects? Because in people that are given antidepressants for reasons other than mental health problems, e.g. pain, the menopause, they also get those withdrawal symptoms. If you think more broadly about psychoactive drugs like recreational drugs, we know coming off cigarettes, alcohol, MDMA, all involve psychological symptoms. So when people say that they're sure that they see recurrence or return to someone's condition, I always say not so fast because there can be very big overlap uh, because we know all these symptoms. Yeah, so can... I, I'm with you. So that, that's why, I mean, I, I'm not assuming, right? That's why I'm asking the question. So that, what I'm really curious about is the time, right? Okay, so so the, I want so to get to that. So another thing. Yes. It, it, let's say like six months out, right? Let's say that you don't have a return of suicidality or whatever, but then you've got essentially remission of psychological symptoms. If you yes. score these people using standardized instruments, um, you know, they, they don't qualify and symptomatically they don't really describe a whole lot. They're doing pretty well. And then six months later, low mood anxiety starts to come back. What's your understanding of like what's going on there? Like, what do you think that is? Is that still withdrawal or are we talking about... So I'll, I'll tell you what is known and, and what I've seen and, and what the uncertainty is. So in the textbooks, it says withdrawal comes on five half lives after antidepressants are removed. And so it's two to five days for most antidepressants. And it's uh, several weeks or a couple of months for fluoxetine. I see in practice all the time that withdrawal effects are delayed. There's a paper in molecular psychiatry uh, where they performed a meta-analysis of serotonin occupancy studies, and they found that while plasma levels of antidepressants go down in a few days, reduction in inhibition of the serotonin transporter, that is the activity in the central compartment, was much slower. And they hypothesized maybe the reason for the delay in withdrawal symptoms in some people is because the drug is sticking around in the brain 
for much longer than it looks like it's sticking around in the in the peripheral blood. So I I, I looked, for example, at sertraline. The half life of sertraline in the blood is is a day, so it's all gone in five days. But if you look at these studies, the half life of it in the brain is more like a week or two. In other words, it's possible that it takes a couple of months or three months for it to leave the brain, and that's why you might have withdrawal effects several weeks or even months afterwards. Because uh, I've seen that a few times. Okay. People people have onset of that are that are delayed. So so I mean I I know. I would even go a little bit further. So you're talking about the serotonin, the drug remaining in the brain. But I, I think part of what we know about SSRIs is that it's not the concentration of the drug itself that leads to the therapeutic benefit, which you may question there, that there even is a therapeutic. We'll get to that in a second. But let's just assume for a moment that SSRIs do have a therapeutic benefit in some people. The interesting thing, right, is that you can't give someone one pill of an SSRI and they'll feel better tomorrow. The reason that it takes six to eight weeks to see a change is this is my understanding. And I, I don't have a PhD in neurobiology of, you know, depression and stuff like that. But even I know that there are actually epigenetic changes and transcription changes in the cells that result in this is why it takes an SSRI two months to hit maximal effect. So what I'm kind of curious about is if we're talking about sort of genetic transcription changes um, is it possible that the reason that we're seeing a resurgence of depression is that whatever these long-term cellular machinery that gets built takes a couple of months to kind of disappear? Nah, sorry. That's not quite true. Here's, here's what antidepressants do. This is week by week following what they do. Uh, this is depression score. This is this is a meta-analysis done by a group that works with drug companies. This is a drug company study. This is placebo. This is antidepressant. Week by week, place people on placebo go down every week, depression scores. Uh, people on antidepressants go down a little tiny bit more every week. There's no delay. It's you, you could say there's a threshold maybe somewhere and then it's there. But really, the effect, most of the effect happens in the first two weeks. So. I, I think this is, uh, you, you could say the cumulative effect is bigger at six to eight weeks, yes. But but all the stories you're talk, talking about epigenetics, those are, I would say they're just so stories. We could talk about why, but but I, I, I think, because if, they, if they're true for antidepressants, then they're also true for placebo, because placebo is having about 85% of Interesting. the effect of antidepressants. So it's a little yeah, bit so hard to follow what you're saying. Um, and, and so I, I mean, I, I saw a paper or not recently, but, you know, I, I've read several papers about how 70 to 80 percent of. Oh, so that that's well, hold on a sec. OK, so let, let, let me respond to that. So a couple things. One is that just because placebo does the same doesn't mean that there isn't a mechanism of epigenetic change or transcription. Right. So the mechanism is completely different from the fact that placebo does it. So sure. I still am kind of curious about whether, you know, what's responsible for that long-term change, and it could absolutely be cellular transcription. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm also sure. very well aware uh, um, that, and maybe this is, you know, preaching to the choir here, that, uh, you know, some meta-analyses more recently really suggest that up to 70% or even more, 80% of the therapeutic effect of SSRIs is from something like placebo or is non-pharmacologic, let's put it that way. And at really only 20 to 30%, there's some meta-analyses that show that SSRIs don't do a whole lot. There's a big reduction, but a small part of that reduction is actually pharmacologic in nature, and most of it is non-pharmacologic. I wouldn't jump straight to placebo, but you can sort of substitute the two. I think it's a little bit more nuanced yeah. than that. So maybe we get into that. I think I think they they I think that the placebo the exactly I, I like your phrasing. I agree with it. That the non pharmacological effects I think explains between eighty and hundred percent of the effect of antidepressants. But that's a just to get back to your question. I guess you, I could say yes. The reason why you get delayed withdrawal effects might be because of flow on effects from the antidepressants, whether that's transcription or epigenetics. Yes, I can agree to that. I think that could be why we don't really understand why. The only thing that I would say is. I have now seen delayed onset withdrawal effects so many times, I can't ignore it. I'm not saying, though, it must be withdrawal effects. It depends on the nature of the symptoms. So I'd like to go through with whoever you're talking yeah. about. What were their symptoms before they started the drugs? What are their symptoms now to think about it clearly? Yeah, let me just actually pause for a second and check in with chat because I recognize that I'm a psychiatrist and you're a psychiatrist. I just want to make sure that everyone is watching. So for those of you all that are watching, like, 
what percentage of this conversation are you following? Do you guys want us to like simplify it a little bit? Sure. Um, and let's just like check in with people and and I mean like I'm loving this, uh, Mark. Okay, so people are following between 70 and 90%, 80%, okay? So I think that's really awesome. Okay, so some people are following like 25%. So, okay, 44%. Now people are getting creative. Okay, so I, I think we've got a pretty educated audience. My guess is that we're averaging somewhere around 75%, and this is a study that's done by me. So let's actually take a step back for a second, uh, Mark, yep. if that's okay. And, that's and instead of digging into the research, which is great, okay, so a lot of people are 70 to 75%. No, do max science. Okay, let's take a step back. We can still do more science. But why don't we start with this? We have this conception of something called depression. And let's call it clinical depression for a second. We have diagnosable illnesses that we, as a field in medicine, say that this is a pathology, this is an illness, this is something that uh, would hopefully benefit from treatment. What's your understanding of what causes depression? Assuming that you even, and if you don't agree with the construct itself, we can even take a further step back. But. Let's 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 play with it and deconstruct it. So you know, I'll, first of all, I want to put my credentials here on the table. So I've studied depression. That was what my PhD was on. It's what I deal with a lot in my clinical practice. But I want to say I have been diagnosed personally with treatment-resistant depression and offered electroconvulsive therapy, lithium, and admission. So I want to say. You know, what I, whatever I'm saying, you know, I'm not on this side of the desk and everyone else on that side of the desk. I'm on both sides of the desk. I've been there. I've got the top, the top diagnosis you can get in the field. So I'm not, you know, I just, I, I want to say what, what I've learned about my own experience and what I've learned from research. I always say, people always say to me, um, you know, after the serotonin paper, the umbrella review in molecular psychiatry, well, if it's not low serotonin, you know, what the hell is it that causes depression? And I say, you know, what would your grandmother say? What would your grandfather say they would say people get depressed demoralized despairing and hopeless when things are very hard overwhelming uh, and exhaust your capacity to cope um, and that's what the research shows if you look at the number of stressful life events that someone has experienced in the last year you can predict with great accuracy whether they'll become depressed or not if you experience loss of a loved one a diagnosis of a new illness lose a job um, uh, there's all these intangibles, poverty, uh, job insecurity. You can predict the risk of withdrawal, uh, the risk of, of having depression. The other factor is how neurotic you are. And neurosis means basically how sensitive you are to stress. So I always say, you know, Barack Obama, incredibly resilient. Uh, me, not very resilient. Uh, you know, and everyone, everyone else in between. Um, so, you know, I think the data is very clear that it's that it's 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 the the events in our lives that determine whether we become demoralized and despairing and at some point you get enough enough points on a score to to someone to say you've got major depressive disorder the other point i bring in is there's a great study done where they followed people uh for 45 years and 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 gave them diagnostic tests uh to see whether they had mental illnesses so have a guess a lock by the age of 45, this is a group, a thousand people, random sample, uh, people born consecutively in a hospital in New Zealand. Have a guess what proportion of people met the criteria for mental illness by the age of 45? 75%. Close, 86%. Of that 86%, most of them were had major depressive disorder or anxiety. And we're talking about historically have met criteria, right? We're not talking about oh. today meet criteria. Which, so we, that's right. So that's overall. So every five yeah. years, they got researchers to go in, give them the DSM, ICD. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Criteria. Yeah. And so by the age of 45, cumulatively, exactly, yeah. altogether, it was 80%. So not every moment. And basically, what they're saying is almost everyone gets depressed or anxious. You know, I ask everyone in the audience, ask you, cast your mind amongst your friends and family, who hasn't had a period, you know, of two weeks of feeling terrible, um, you know, lying in bed, not being able to do things. I've got one friend. He's very cheerful. He's never been down. I hate his guts. Everyone else I know has had that has had that happen in their lives. In other words, this gets to me to the key question, which is, is depression a normal response to circumstances in life, or is it the sign of an abnormal brain? And I would I would I would say, and an abnormal brain, you know, means that's an illness. That's a, that's a pathological state. I would say, if seventy percent or more of of people have this event, 
then it sounds like a pretty normal response to certain circumstances, not the sign of pathology or something abnormal, although it can feel, although, you know, it can damn well feel like that. Because I've had people who've gotten you know, upset at me saying this, they say, you don't know what it feels like to be depressed. The answer is I do. It can feel like an illness. It can feel like you, you know, can't move your body. Every thought is black. It can absolutely feel like your brain is broken, you know, but if you zoom out, I think, you know, the human experience involves some very unpleasant emotions. You know, I feel like I've had uh, a fair share being very bleak, being despairing, being suicidal. I think that's, you know, that's a part of being human. It's, you know, I've been writing letters of complaint to the, to the manufacturers for a long time. Uh, that's, that's sort of built in. And so I, you know, I would, you can hear I'm querying this idea that it's an illness, that it's a discrete um, condition like a, like heart disease or like high cholesterol. And then the last point I'd make is it is clearly, you know, th these, these, these uh, major depressive disorder was coined by a group of senior psychiatrists in the 1980s who sat around a table to work out, should it have five symptoms or six symptoms or four symptoms? And they kind of, there's a great book written about this uh, by James Davies uh, called Cracked, where he, he, he interviewed a lot of the different um, people on that committee. And they say things like this, we thought six symptoms was too many, four sounded too few, so we went for five. Somewhere in there, one of them said, you can't put that symptom as part of the diagnostic criteria, I do that. Uh, one of them described it as a group of friends getting together to choose a restaurant to eat at. Someone suggests Chinese, someone suggests Indian, they compromise on Italian. In other words, it was people sitting around, uh, white, generally educated, senior psychiatrists in the so, northeast of America deciding on these things. Uh, so, Mark, let me just uh, kind of ask a couple things. So in the DSM, there's something called adjustment disorder with depressed mood. Yeah. So my understanding, let's just, uh, I'll share my understanding of that, right? So that when we sort of diagnose people with depression, we'll say like one of two things. Either this is a independent pathological process, like an yes. illness, and then yes. someone gets diagnosed with something like major depressive disorder. Yes. On the other side, there is something where people experience something that looks very similar to major depressive disorder, <clears throat> but there is a clear life circumstance that we can tie to those feelings of despair, you know, low mood, et cetera. Are you basically saying that all of MDD is basically a version of adjustment disorder, that that's what causes depression, the circumstances in our life and our inability to cope with them? Um, look, put it this way, uh, say a couple of things here. Um, so there's this, I remember getting this, I remember being taught this thing in, 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 in university. There are these people out there that have perfect lives and they're, and they're depressed. They have uncaused depression. Now, you know, I've worked for 15 years on and off in clinical settings. I've never met such a person in my life ever. Maybe you have, maybe other psychiatrists have, but I haven't. People always have reasons for, for, for things happening. Um, there was a marketing campaign in England to sell Effexor. Uh, and it sent around a pamphlet to GPs and it said, you should treat depression even if it's in the context of understandable reasons in life. You know, they were trying to get past this because they surveyed the population um, at that time. And the population said, they asked them what it causes depression. They said what I was saying. They said, when things go wrong in your life. Um, and they wanted to, con they, they, they essentially wanted to, you know, they wanted to create a market and they wanted to uh, make it larger. So they wanted to, include uh, all these things as an illness because of course you can treat an illness you don't treat normal states of, of life so i think basically what you're saying you know adjustment disorder sounds very kind of very narrow because of course there are things that are going to happen early on in life that have long-term effects so i'm not going to say you know for every person who's depressed look what happened yesterday um but yes in general the data you know the, the studies say it's the events in people's lives you know the study i'm talking about is by kenneth kendler a big researcher in America, the BSU. He looks at, at people either six months or a year before. I'm sure there is a longer tail to things that happen in childhood. But yes, he shows these, in, I'll, I'll put it this way. In his studies, the lines between number of stresses and risk of depression are like this, the most incredible straight lines. If you look at chemicals between depress, depression and healthy volunteers, it's flat. Neuroimaging findings, flat. Specific genetics, flat. So 
compared to that, what my grandmother would have said exactly matches the science, a huge effect. Whereas all these supposed abnormalities in the brain, uh, uh, you know, don't don't come out. Um, so I, yeah, so I, so I think I think so, a lot of major is about context. Okay, so so we're basically saying that depression, or you're you're saying that depression is essentially caused by circumstances in the ability or inability to cope. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're uh, I mean, so I'd say there's a, say a couple of things. One, okay, capacity to cope, and two, there's sort of a, an emotional needs section. I'd say as well. I'd say people are happy when their emotional needs are met, and people are miserable when their emotional needs are not met. Not okay. met. And that sort of that sort of flows into you know, I don't know that's there's a you know there's a slightly more complicated picture but you know essentially mood is a kind of a readout for how things are going in life. Can I think for a second? Yeah. So if this is the case, um, yes. which, which I, I don't disagree with, I, I, actually, let me just respond to a couple of things. So the first thing yeah. you said is that people with perfect lives can still be depressed and the people have used that as evidence that there is a chemical imbalance of the brain, which, which I think is very consistent with what, what I was taught, um, which is that, you know, if depression is caused by circumstances, then people who have good circumstances should not be depressed. Since depression is, since there are people who have good circumstances who are depressed, that therefore, I'm just sharing with you the logic. I'm not saying I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, it's fine, right? it's fine. Right, so since there are other people who have good lives who end up being depressed, that suggests to some people that there's some sort of independent pathological process that transcends beyond circumstance. So what I would kind of say, first of all, is that I'm with you that there are people with uh, perfect lives who are unhappy. And I, I think the flip side of it is also that there are people with imperfect lives who are happy. Both of those things are true. Yes. A and so I kind of agree with you, but I, I think that the, the interesting thing is that I think that we sort of correlate, I think the correlation with a perfect life or an imperfect life and happiness or unhappiness, I think is sort of a tricky one. And if we look at sort of like research on things like mindfulness, or if we look at, you know, kind of like anecdotal evidence of um, Eastern like meditative practices and stuff like that, we sort of discover that there is a way to build resilience. There is a way that's, I would kind of call it this, that's the scientific term, not the spiritual term, but yes. cultivating something called detachment or vairagya which is now a big part of things like acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, we're seeing some of these concepts kind of bleed in, is really what's responsible for being happy or unhappy. It doesn't actually have much to do with your circumstances, or has some, some to do with your circumstances. But there are other variables. It's not just circumstance equals happiness or unhappiness. And I think what happened in, in our profession is that someone was like, there's a second variable in there because this doesn't add up. And what they sort of threw in was this is a chemical imbalance. Whereas what I would kind of say is there are other variables as well, like some of these spiritual capacities, emotional co co quotient, um, the capacity to be resilient, stuff like that, or even things like support structures. And, and so I'm, I'm totally with you that I don't think that circumstances are sufficient or what we can see as apparent circumstances in the here and now are sufficient to say that someone should or should not be depressed. And there's one study, for example, that... Um, was looking at, I think, s not suicidal thoughts, but maybe suicide attempts or completed suicides in men and sort of found that up to 50 or 60% of them did not have any evidence of mental illness. And so th that also kind of brings into question, like, and it's and that's actually kind of consistent with my clinical experience, which is that a lot of the people that I've worked with who are very suicidal, I don't think that they're actually like, their brain is malfunctioning. I think they have a very, very genuine and fair assessment that their life has unsolvable problems and that suicide is an escape from them. Yeah. So 
So can I respond to a few things there? I yeah. think the sense, a few things, a lot of the, a lot, a lot of I agree with you there. Um, I just basically I would say this: let's sit, we could simplify this conversation by just taking away this made-up term, which we're using, which is major depressive disorder. Just to take it away for a second, see what see what changes. I'm I would say, you. I would say. So I agree with you. I'm not saying it's a completely. If you have a terrible life, you're going to be depressed. If you have a great life, no. I understand there's all sorts of other factors. I'm 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 putting together a very simple model in a short conversation. Um, yes, and I and I understand mindfulness and the way you respond to things. And of course, it's how you interpret situations, not just situations themselves. I agree with that. Um, I guess the the basic thing is we're talking about people's lives and their minds. Mindfulness is a bit about habits of mind. I'm talking about contextual threats and stresses. What we're not talking about is chemicals. And I would say, I think that's a category error. So I want to get to that and then I'll respond to a few things you've said. So I think if you say depression is caused by a chemical imbalance, I think that sentence makes no sense. I don't think it's, I, I think it's wrong, but I also think it makes no sense in the following way. So I, I'll give you a couple I of- I agree, by the way. I'll give, I'll give you a couple of analogies, but I want to, I want to you know, I, so I'll give you a couple of stories. You know, let's say a friend of yours comes up to you and says, I'm incredibly miserable. I'm totally despairing. My mother has just died. And you say to her, look, you know, I'm a clever guy. I'm, I'm up on the latest science. I'm not going to talk about your mother, get into that stuff. Let's get into the deep stuff. Let's get your amygdala in an MRI. Let's work out what's really going on. You know, that's ridiculous. You know, that's a, that would be a, a sociopathic response. Obviously, the important thing is what's happened in her life. I'm sure there are changes in her amygdala. I'm sure there are changes in her chemistry, but that is not the right level at which to think about things. So I, you're a, you're a computer guy. I'll give you that the hackneyed uh, software hardware analogy. But I think it's very important. You know, when Microsoft Word breaks, you can see how simple a computer guy I am. You, that is happening. The, Microsoft Word is instantiated in the circuits of your computer. You know, if you turn, if you get rid of the circuit board, it doesn't work anymore. But if Microsoft Word breaks down, you don't call up the circuit guy to solder the circuit board. You call up the software guy. So if depression is about uh, not getting your emotional needs met, your perspective on life, uh, your uh, stress is overwhelming you, you call up the guys that deal with those things. You're talking about mindfulness, you're talking about maybe you need a social worker, blah, blah, blah. If you call the guy that deals with, with brain circuits, I'm sure there might be changes there. If you sit in a dark room, miserable i'm sure it changes the chemistry in your brain i'm sure that's true but it's still not the right area to intervene in and i think uh, i'm sorry to say that a lot of psychiatry is based on a category error where all of course the mind of course feelings is in the brain of course it's either electricity or chemistry i just don't think that's the right level at which to to intervene my last little analogy is you know when you learn japanese for example a new language of course you change the chemistry and electricity of your brain of course you do but if someone said to you, I'm not going to Japanese classes anymore, I'm at home trying to work out how to change the electricity and chemistry in my brain to learn Japanese, you'd think they were mad. And it's because they've made a category error. And I think a lot of psychiatry is based on that category error of mistaking people's lives and their mind for the brain. Although I'm not a dualist, of course, the mind is in the brain. It's just the wrong level at which to understand things. Yeah, and, so, and otherwise, everything you said, I, I, I yeah, agree. yeah, I, I, I think we're speaking the same language here, right? So I, I think you pointed out the one big difference, the one big flaw in the analogy of when I call when I when Microsoft Word breaks, I don't call the circuit board guy. Is that in the human brain, Microsoft Word can rewire the circuit, right? That's exactly what you just said. It, is that we we know you know that it, I, any thoughts that you have can shape the the physiology of your brain, the electrical activity of your brain. So th I think that, but but you just kind of, and I think we kind of know that you can still believe that even though it can shape the physiology of your brain, you're, you're well within your rights to say I don't think that's where the real therapeutic value is. So even if if Microsoft Word can change our circuit board, w the problem is still fixing Microsoft Word. So exactly. that the circuit board reshapes in the right way. We still want to intervene up here. And I think we're on the same yeah, page there. Is that fair? Exactly. I yeah. agree with you. I'm sure that losing a loved one, you know, the despair, you know, can, can change the chemistry of your brain. I'm sure that's true. I still think that the, you know, the issue is getting to the grieving process, you know, finding other sources of intimacy. It's still up here at the Microsoft Word level, even if there are, you know, downstream effects at the, um, at the brain level. And I think, you know, when people when I have this conversation with people, I think what gets some people is they say, no, it feels different. It becomes something different. I know what sadness is. 
I know what feeling hopeless is. Yes, that's all Microsoft Word life. But when I've been really depressed, you know, it feels physical. I can't move. And I felt that, you know, I want to say I've, I've had psychomotor retardation, you know, in depression. Uh, so I, I've been up that and end. How, how, how do you understand that experience for people? When they say uh, this feels different. I've been sad. I've been hopeless. Because I've certainly had that experience with patients as well. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's a bit hard because, you know, I don't want to be saying to somebody, look, you know, you're wrong. Your interpretation is wrong. Mine's right. You know, I don't want to, you know, that's a bit of a, a very conflictual take. I can only say I have been in that state and it was for clear life reasons. You know, yes, I, you know, I, I think you can get into a bit of a, a vicious cycle, you know something's gone wrong in your life, you lose confidence, you can't do anything to change it, you become hopeless. I think that can become a self-perpetuating cycle and it can feel like you can't escape from it. And I guess, you know, it does have biological effects potentially that put you in a state that's a bit like hibernation. You know, that's look, that's what, what depression looks like to me. And yet, you know, even though I'm sure there are biological changes, I still think the solution, you know, as it was for me and as it was, I think, for other people, is dealing with the life things. You know, if you have some of those things met in your life, that you can get out of such states. Can we talk about that for a second? So, so you you said you were diagnosed with treatment resistant depression, and and you know it sounds like you were uh, uh, tried all kinds of stuff. Are, are, yeah. are you? Do you feel depressed nowadays? If you feel comfortable answering this, I'm okay. I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this. Um, it's a bit complicated because there's, there's 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 medications involved and withdrawal effects. But the answer is, I've got to say, I have. Um, so at the moment. You know, I, I have I'm going through withdrawal from the antidepressants that I'm on, and so I do have some withdrawal effects that do occasionally put me in a in a dysphoric mood. I've got to say, I've had a very big change in me, and that's the way that I think about myself, which was all the things that I've talked about. I used to think I had a thing called depression, uh, and now I don't think that's true anymore. I I think I've been through you know I went through uh, things growing up that were very distressing to me. I think that had a big effect on me, but I don't think that I'm inherently a depressed person or have a thing called depression. I think I've I've, I've experienced traumatic periods that, that affected me. I'm a you know I'm a slightly more 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 mature uh, person these days, so I no longer think of myself as someone that has depression. Uh, I've had bad periods. I'm sure I'll have bad periods again. Life being what it is, I'm a, probably a pessimistic, you know, slightly neurotic person. Uh, that's my Jewish heritage. Um, but but I, I don't, you know, so now, you know, my mood's okay. And and no, I don't think I've got a lifelong illness is how yeah, I think Yeah, so it I'm curious, when you reconceptualized yourself that way, how did that affect your depression? Right, so it's all, it's all mixed up. Medication, biology, depression is all mixed up. So... You know, part of me walking around taking medication every day for 15 years, you know, was I'm basically I'm I mean, I had complicated ideas. I'm not going to say I thought oh, I was a chemical imbalance. We have drugs. I'm I thought I was a sophisticated academic in this area. But I thought there was basically something wrong with me uh, that medication helped to either dull or fix. Uh, and, you know, I, I had certain limitations in my life that other people didn't have because I was prone this way. When I started coming off the antidepressants, I had this terrible period of time coming coming off them. Initially, I had to go back on them because it was such an unpleasant withdrawal period. I came off. I came off them. Much Makes more you feel slowly. broken, huh? To be able to to have to go back onto an antidepressant. Well, that was. It's funny. It's, it's it broke the spell. It's really funny. I had the opposite effect. When I had withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants, it broke the spell of what I thought was in my hand. I thought I had this benign, you know, curative substance. Mm. When coming off it, led me to almost kill myself. I I developed. Panic attacks for the first time in my life. I couldn't sleep. I felt really suicidal for a sustained period of time because life was so hard. I, I, it, it, it broke the spell. I thought this drug is not what I was taught it was. This drug has caused me incredible trouble coming off, and that that did that started to break the spell. So when I went back on it, I knew I was going back on it not because I had depression and needed the drug. I was going back on it because I was dependent on an antidepressant, and it was too unpleasant to come off it, and I had to find a different way. So when I went back on it, I already had different ideas. I, 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 was, I was frightened by the process of coming off and I, and I waited another couple of years. I then started coming off much more slowly in the way that I've sort of indicated over months, now years, in this very slow way, a little bit at a time. In doing that, it made me think, you know, uh, I, I, re, I re-examined uh, 
studies that show that these drugs prevent relapse because you might be aware that the reason why these drugs are recommended for long-term treatment in the American guidelines and elsewhere is because of studies that show that if you stop them, people get worse. And in these studies, the antidepressants are stopped over a few days, often abruptly, and they measure mood and, and sleep. They, don't, they never measure withdrawal symptoms. And so I started to think, hold on, these studies are showing that people get withdrawal symptoms from coming off antidepressants, not necessarily that they stop um, yeah, it's, it's, really it's scary, right? Because like I, I see what you're kind of saying is that so if you go off the SSRI and you start feeling suicidal, it's a very easy logical step to say the SSRI is fixing the suicidality. Suicide. And if exactly. we restart it, the suicidality goes away. Therefore, it's working. But yeah. if you reconceptualize it as a withdrawal problem, that the suicidality is being induced by the withdrawal of the SSRI, then it changes the picture. It changes everything. It changes every so, it changes every guideline for every drug in psychiatry. So let me ask you this. What about the case of I'm suicidal, I start an SSRI, and the suicidality goes away? Is that placebo? That's a different can I can I finish this just the sure. one thing about the prevention thing? Um, it's hard to keep up with you. It's it's fun, but it's a uh, panting. Um, uh, ex exactly what you just said about if you stop it, you get worse. People think it must be the drugs preventing it. You could do the same thing with cigarettes. You could say if you, people who stop cigarettes become anxious and irritable, therefore people must need cigarettes to prevent anxiety and irritability. That's, that's absurd. But I think that's a lot what's going on with antidepressant studies because they are stopped abruptly. You know, that's crazy by anyone's standards. Right. That's why I asked the question about, so let's, yeah. but, but so the person who starts smoking cigarettes doesn't, is not already angry and irritable and going through withdrawal, right? So there's okay, something so that causes the suicidality before we start okay. antidepressant medication. So, so let's, so let's, okay. So and, let's, and then we, we have, you know, some evidence and my clinical experience is that Patients get, fall into three categories. This is clinical, okay? So I've yeah. seen the studies that show that, I've seen studies showing the efficacy of SSRIs. I've seen studies showing that the majority of the effect of SSRIs are um, uh, primarily placebo or non-pharmacologic in nature. So I'm, I'm actually like kind of okay with both of those. So I'm yeah. just sharing clinical experience because yeah. what I think we're talking about is like, there are people who actually have this problem, right? Okay. And there are hopefully going to be mental health professionals, including prescribers, who will one day watch this talk. So okay. my clinical experience is that there are three camps of people. Yep. For a third of people, SSRIs do absolutely nothing. Yep. For a third of people, this is my clinical experience, okay? For a third of people, SSRIs may help, may not help. If they do help, the effect seems to be small, and we're probably like kind of in that placebo range where I don't feel like there's a good clinical need to keep them on it. If they feel more secure, like kind of psychodynamically, and this is like the psychodynamics of psychopharmacology, like I think that there's something there. And I would say that for a third of my patients that people really do get better. And even in that third of patients, I think there's about half of those will try to taper people off and we'll sort of talk about the risks and stuff. I've seen some of these studies of, you know, I'm cautious about, like you kind of said, some of these basic principles of the human brain, which is that anything that we add in pill form that has a constant effect on your body will develop some kind of physiologic adaptation, whether it's alcohol and upregulating our liver enzymes or benzodiazepines and the GABA receptor, caffeine, anything that we add, except for things like water, and even things like water. I mean, you can look at people who are dehydrated or drink too much and you'll see changes in their kidneys, right? So you'll see all kinds of adaptations. So what do you think is going on for the people who say, hey, I know what sadness is, I know what help, uh, hopelessness is, I've taken this antidepressant and it's really changed this thing for me. Okay, so, so take a step back and say something philosophical have you so there, there's a concept the so what does get better mean with these drugs so there's there's professor moncrief is a professor of psychiatry in england and she has uh, this way of looking at, at drugs so there's one one way of looking at what does get better mean is through is through what she calls the disease-centered model you've got a you've got a condition depression you give a drug it fixes it an example might be you've got an infection, you give an antibiotic, the antibiotic kills the infection, the cough and the cold goes away, you've got better. Uh, 
or insulin for diabetes is, is, is a common analogy. You've got diabetes, you don't have enough insulin, you give insulin, it fixes the diabetes. And people uh, suggest, people, people have argued, mostly drug companies, but now lots of uh, people have accepted this, that antidepressants are somehow fixing the issue in depression, and that's why people get better. Okay, that's one, that's one uh, interpretation. Another interpretation she calls the drug-centered model, and that is psychiatric drugs, like recreational drugs, have psychoactive effects. They change the way we think and we feel. And an example would be if you drink alcohol and you have social anxiety disorder, you feel less anxious, you feel, you feel more uh, disinhibited, you feel more relaxed, you can talk in, in social situations. And people would say on alcohol, social anxiety disorder, I feel better. And what, what you've done is you've, you've added a drug that suppresses their underlying anxiety. You wouldn't say you've fixed the underlying cause in social anxiety, nor would you say social anxiety is caused by an alcohol deficiency. Uh, and so get better. They're still saying they feel better, but it's that you've got a different interpretation. And, and so, let, let's just for the audience jump in for a second and remember that the actual FDA approved treatments that we have for social anxiety include basically alcohol in pill form. Right. So that analogy is really good because when yeah. we're benzodiazepines, the class of medications work very similar to alcohol. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think it's so, a fantastic analogy. And let's 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 just follow that analogy for a second, and then we'll come back to antidepressants. So let's talk about alcohol in in social anxiety. So of course it, we've all we've all drunk alcohol for social anxiety. I'm sure everyone in the audience has. Um, we know a few things about alcohol. We know in the long term the effect wears off. That's because of tolerance and dependence. We know there's withdrawal effects from stopping it. We know it's toxic to the brain and the liver and several organs of the body. We know that recreational drugs that make you feel better are generally bad for you, and we all know that. We choose to drink alcohol. Some of us because it's more fun than the dangers that it causes us. Um, you might start to think, well, drugs that act similarly might have similar uh, effects in the long term. Let's come back to antidepressants. So how do antidepressants work? Uh, there's, there's, there's basically, let's, let's go straight for it. If you ask people uh, who are on antidepressants, 50 to 70% of different studies say they feel emotionally numbed. What does that mean? Their positive and their negative emotions are restricted. What was a 10 is now a three. Uh, uh, that correlates with genital numbing. People that have emotional numbing often also have genital numbing, sexual side effects. In fact, I'm writing a textbook on how to safely stop these drugs. And in it, I talk about how to crush up tablets. If you crush up most antidepressants and swish it around your mouth with water, your mouth will become numb. In other words, there is an anesthetic property that affects emotions, physical tissue, including your, your mouth, but especially your genitals. Now, if you were suicidal or panicked or anxious and you're given an antidepressant that has a mild numbing effect, then you might feel a lot better and you might say, gee, doc, I feel a lot better. I'm not taking that away from anybody. Um, you know, that might be very useful, might save someone's life. Uh, but when you think about get better, Getting better in the short term may not mean getting better in the long term because we know alcohol wears off, alcohol causes problems. Uh, we know that antidepressants like SSRIs have a very similar mode of action to MDMA or ecstasy. They both affect the serotonin transporter. In fact, the SNRIs affect both the serotonin and noradrenaline transporters as MDMA does. Um, so you could start to think you're taking a drug that causes numbing in the short term. One, that might have consequences in the long term. It might cause... Uh, changes in quality of life, a lack of access to positive emotions, affecting intimacy. Um, so what happens in the short term might not play out in the long term. The drugs might wear off because of tolerance, as you said, to any drug because of physiological adaptation. And it may have consequences for sleep, concentration, memory, weight, which antidepressants do in the long term. So I'm not arguing with you, do some people feel better? I'm just arguing what, is, what causes that, and then I'll argue with that a little bit as well. Um, so, so one, uh, and, that, and that's why getting back to you talking about epigenetic changes and things. So there is that explanation for what, what antidepressants do. It's in, it's in study after study done by drug company groups and, and independent groups. Uh, numbing is, is, uh, is, is, is caused. In fact, they did a study recently in healthy volunteers because there's this debate, is this emotional blunting caused by depression or antidepressants? They gave three weeks of Lexapro to healthy volunteers and they demonstrated emotional numbing. So it's very clear it's because of the drugs. It may be also because of depression, but it's very clear there's a big effect from the drugs. Uh, I think you know that's the most obvious explanation of how antidepressants work. That was definitely my experience. Now that I'm coming off it, it's become much more clear. So all of these biological explanations 
is trying to get you to think in a disease-centered way. When you talk about fixes serotonin, epigenetics, inflammation, yeah, well, it's let me, trying to convince you that me, these thing in a in a come kind of deep biological. Yeah, way. yeah. So I, I, I'm with you there. So let me just let me ask you this. So from a clinical perspective, right? So you're yeah. saying that okay. So the therapeutic value of antidepressants is that they numb things. So let's yeah. assume that that's the case for a moment. Okay. Do you think there's therapeutic value of numbing things? Uh, if there was no other consequences, I think probably yes, but there is. So this is what I'd say antidepressants do. This is how I give informed consent to a patient. This drug has this drug is minimally effective in in randomized controlled trials. It's it's two points better than than, than placebo. Um, it may work. It probably works by numbing. We don't know. There's all sorts of other theories. I'll talk about them a little bit more. But we know that most, the majority of people on these drugs will report numbing. Uh, so we'll report that as being helpful. There are also side effects. It causes weight gain, nausea, sexual. Half of people will get sexual side effects. Half of you will have emotional blunting, which will be a problem for some people in the long term. It causes disrupted sleep. It causes impaired concentration, impaired memory. The longer you stay on it, the harder it will be to come off. Some people find it so hard to come off these medications, they, they have to stay on the medications. Some people are debilitated by the withdrawal symptoms that they have. We have now discovered that the sexual side effects from these drugs persist after stopping in some people. We don't know who. It may last for months or years. It may even be permanent. There are in, in, the, in England, there are 19 treatments that are equally effective and cost effective to antidepressants. That's in the national guidelines. They include uh, mindfulness, exercise, various forms of interpersonal and private therapy, uh, individual therapy. The number one most cost effective treatment this was a nine-year analysis by the government department uh, that, that looks after these uh, looks after guidelines. Was problem-solving therapy for severe depression. It was the most cost-effective uh, effective treatment. Uh, so that's what I say to people: these are the alternatives. These are the side effects. These are the benefits. This is how it might work. I think number one, is, I think the mechanism of action is very important because if you're told. You've got can a can I jump in with a question? Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you offer this kind of informed consent, yeah, how do do people usually elect to take an antidepressant? Generally, they don't. Generally, they don't. And if they did elect to take an antidepressant, what impact do you think your informed consent would have on their therapeutic response? I think the therapeutic response. I'm not sure, but but the main so. Let's say let's say we agree, and maybe we do a bit that they caught that they act by numbing. Uh, I think then it's important to use it short term. So, for example, let's say it's something like giving alcohol for our social no, anxiety. I, that, that wasn't the question I asked. I asked, what impact do you think your informed consent would have on the person's response to the medication? Uh, well, uh, you, you, you've mentioned the psychodynamics or psychopharmacology. I guess when you when someone says this drug is is a whiz bang, super fantastic, it'll solve things in your life. That tends to enhance the effect. So I guess what I'm doing is not doing that. So I'm probably not enhancing the placebo effect in any way. Uh, yeah, I would but, even if I heard that, I would think that we're inducing a nocebo effect. Well, I'm telling I'm them telling them I'm telling them facts. I'm telling them I, I will I will pull out, for example. I think the, the patient information leaflet inside the drugs, which I think most doctors say, don't look at that. It's written by the lawyers. Don't worry about it. I say, look at that. It's written by the lawyers. You know, that's important. They wouldn't put it in if it wasn't, if it wasn't real. Uh, and I'd take people through that. Um, so I'm, I'm telling them what, what facts there are. I'm giving them the, the data. Um, I, so I think there's a real paternalism into telling people this drug is great and will help you. I think that that is no long, I don't think that's an ethical position to take if the drug, if that doesn't match the, the, the drugs. That is a very old fashioned idea. The doctor knows best, this drug is gonna be good for you, so I'm gonna encourage you to take it. I feel that in my training, we were, we, were, we were induced, educated to convince people to take the drugs, which meant we underplayed harms and we exaggerated benefits, uh, and I don't think that's I don't think that's ethical practice. I, I'm with you, but we're. I mean, I, I think it still sounds paternalistic, right? It's just doc, doctor still knows best. It's just doctor is telling you that this is going to hurt you. So, so, what was the last bit? Sorry, the doctor is telling you that this is going to hurt you, and won't work. Well, well I, I'm telling them the the facts. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not. It's not my opinion that the drug is going to cause you know 50 percent of people to have sexual side effects. That's what the studies show. That's that's I think that informed consent, you know, the modern doctor-patient relationship means you tell them the facts and they make the decision. 
Yeah, so I, I, I think that that's... Uh, I use antidepressants, I think, in a very similar way. So usually when I think about antidepressants, I'm kind of with you that there's a ton of other stuff. And what I tell people is, I don't think that antidepressants cure depression. So as long as you're on the antidepressant, it may have effect, may not have an effect. As I mentioned, I'm well aware that a large part of that effect is placebo. Um, what I usually find with people is that I tell them, look, if you really want to get a handle on your depression, you probably need to make, you have to invest a lot of time and energy to try to fix your life. So this includes everything from meditating to doing things like psychotherapy, processing trauma. So for example, like chronic depression, in my experience of treatment resistant depression, is that it's not even depression. It's actually trauma masquerading as depression. So there's a lot of correlations, and I think this was even in some of the papers, I think that maybe even you wrote, um, which you're not the only one, but you know the impact of adverse childhood experiences on later depression. Yeah. And so usually what kind of wh where I kind of come down is that, look, if you've got time, so I think if you really want to get a handle on this problem, and this is there's a selection bias here too because these are the people that come to me. If you really want to get a handle on this problem, I don't think the SSRI is going to fix it. What an SSRI will do, I don't use the word numb, but I think the SSRI is for people who don't have the bandwidth to get a handle on the problem. And then you will see a mitigation, hopefully, of the things that keep you from engaging with your problems. So there are cases where, once again, I'm talking about my clinical experience, where people will say like, okay, I can't get out of bed in the morning. If we start an SSRI, they do feel some amount of numbing of negative feelings. Completely agree with that characterization. Yeah. And that numbing of negative feelings allows them to engage in the parts of their life that really lead to real healing. And and th this is where in my clinical experience, like I'm not saying this is right. This is just, I'm sharing what I do. And, and you know, I go through a pretty rigorous informed consent process. Um, but what my experience has been is that even when I start people on an SSRI, my goal is to use that runway Right. So we can kind of think about it. I'll, I'll even assume for a moment that all it does is numb things and then use that runway to start building healthier things into your life and then actually take people off of the medication. So in my preference as a clinician and, you know, it ultimately depends on providing the patient with informed consent and they can end up doing what they want to with their life. Um, but if people are looking for straight psychopharm, I just don't see like straight psychopharm patients. I, I don't it's you know, I think that like psychopharm is a tool even things like benzodiazepines, which we know can cause life-threatening and fatal withdrawal and cause dependency and can cause, you know, impacts on even things like dementia and stuff like that. So all of these medications, I think just like cholesterol medication or anything else, has a risk and a benefit. And the real place that I've seen SSRIs have, and this is as someone who prescribes them rarely, is that it provides people a runway to really build up the rest of the things so that we can take them off. I'm curious what you think about that. So, so look, you know, what you're outlining, you know, to me is, you know, close to ideal practice. You're doing it, you're doing it, uh, you know, reluctantly for a small amount of cases, you're using it, uh, you're, you're focusing on other things, you're doing it short term. I would just add a couple of things that I'm not, you know, so I don't want to make this, I'm not criticizing your personal practice, of course. That's, you can, I, by the way. I don't, I don't mind. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> just, you sound like a very thoughtful, very sensible person. Um, uh, I'd say a couple of things. One, you talk about psychodynamics. You're, when you give a medication to somebody, you're telling them you do not have the solution inside. You, you need a medication and you're ill because doctors give medication to ill people. There are good studies on this that say when people accept a medication, they accept a biological explanation for their, their illness. In the short term, the effect is very relieving. They think it's not my fault. It's, it's an illness. The doctor recognizes it. He does this all the time. In the long term, it's disempowering because I think I've got a broken brain. I've got an illness. I've got, you know, I went through that process itself. So it is not a neutral or a, or a, or a definitely positive thing to give a medication. There are all sorts of other messages that come along with it. Uh, so it can be very disempowering. Um, that's one. Two, um, uh, there's this idea that, that together therapy and medication work better and that medication is a bridge to therapy. Medication get you activated. Um, we've just done a big analysis that shows that people on medication have a worse response to therapy. And the difference between our study and other studies were the other studies are all short term. Again, the six to 12 weeks, start an antidepressant, get a bit of a, a numbing or a high uh, and, the, and the therapy. We're looking at people who are on long-term antidepressants 
So it may not be relating to your practice, but we see a definite reduction in efficacy of therapy. And we think the reason is therapy is can about I, can accident. I, can I give that a shot? Yeah, have a guess. So, have a guess. so I, I, think, I think the real therapeutic action in therapy is actually being able to access and process our emotions. Exactly. And that if we have a numbing agent, then our ability to get into the really hurtful stuff and actually fix it becomes hampered. So it keeps it at bay. It walls it off. But once exactly. you wall something off, whether it's an abscess or a psychological hurt, you can't drain it. You can't fix it. You have to break down the walls to actually get in there and fix the problem. That would be my guess. Yep. Got it in one. Exactly. You know, or it could be the cognitive impairment. So you can't think through things, but I think that's it. It's, it's a lack of uh, access to emotions and also to clear thinking. And exactly. I think therapy is a lot about in a safe space, accessing very painful memories, trauma, de de-traumatizing them, you know, working through it in some way. And that releases people from emotions. You can see then in giving medication, it's not a completely neutral act. And you also said people who don't have the capacity or the bandwidth. I mean, I would say depression is a signal going off in people's lives. Something is wrong, you know, and that signal can lead to big changes. I mean, if you've got to break up with your partner, you've got to change your job. It's a very, you know, it can ruin your life. You know, it, it can cause huge disruption, but then, you know, is it really the right thing to do to put something over that light and cover it up? So I would say just to, just to go to a personal note, when I walked into the doctor's office when I was 21, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do the course that I was doing. I wasn't sure I wanted to have the same friends that I had. I wasn't sure I wanted to be the same person that I was. And I remember thinking, you know, I was, I read a lot of therapy. I read Nietzsche. I read all these things. And I thought there's two possibilities here. Either I have to change every aspect of my life or I've got an illness. And I, in the end, knocked on the door and they said, yes, it's an illness. And I felt great relief. I would give anything for that doctor to have said, look, Mark, you're a troubled young man and there is no way out of this instead of, you know, unless, you know, without working through difficult issues of who you are and what your place is in the world. I don't have any pills that will deal with that in, in my in my desk. I would have been really pissed off at her if she said that. I would have been, you know, what are you talking about? I've read about these things, but I would have been very grateful to her later on. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So, you know, I, I sometimes people will ask, we'll, we'll do stuff on depression, right? So this is an example. And over time, though, like I get the same set of questions. And, and so I made this thing called a guide to depression, and it sort of mirrors my clinical practice. And only 20% of it is clinical. 80% of it, so a big part of the guide to depression is like finding purpose. And, and what are, like, if we look back in, in these ancient days and we had people, and I, I think there are people who are perfectly happy, like Buddha is a good example of someone who I think really had a, a level of tranquility that was so profound that a religion cropped up around him. And, and there are actual spiritual techniques. And you mentioned that, you know, mindfulness is one of the 19 things that we know has sort of positive healing powers for, for something like depression. And in my experience, uh, you know, especially when I work with like men, that a lot of the depression is not, I mean, you can take a pill and, and I, I kind of view it almost the same way that I view cholesterol medication which is that you can take cholesterol medication will artificially lower your cholesterol. And there's all kind. by the way, there's the same problems with cholesterol medication that we have with SSRIs, which is that this idea that cholesterol induces all these heart attacks and stuff. There are a lot of methodologic methodological flaws with cholesterol as well. I don't know how familiar you are with that stuff, but it's very similar. Maybe not quite as bad as depression. I think there's more of a, a clear yeah, biological. You know, effect. I really know a little bit of the, this is the fat stuff and the, the Ansel keys, but, but yeah, yeah. But at least there is actual chemical changes that they found in cholesterol. I mean, it's right, right. So, so there's more biology to cholesterol. It's even worse, but, it's even worse in depression. But, but I, if, I if we if we really look at you know, and and, and I'll, I, I've had friends and family members and patients who will go to a cardiologist who's like hyper aggressive with like lowering their cholesterol, and and like you know your cholesterol needs to be like way below even what the drug companies recommend because lower cholesterol means longer life, and that's the kind of thing where it, you know I, I think that. If you really want to fix your cholesterol, it's all lifestyle changes, basically. And there may be some genetic component to having high cholesterol, even if you do all the right things. Um, but but I, I think it's kind of the same thing. It's like you can actually fix your problems or you can take a pill that will mitigate the damage of the life that you live. And I think the really tricky thing for me as a physician ethically is that there are some people who are never going to work out. There are some people, and even I... 
I have a criticism with that as well, because I think it's our duty as physicians. And one of the things that really bothers me about physicians is that even in medical training, you're, you're a medical doctor, right? If I, yes. a PhD and MBBS, right? Yeah. So one of the things that really bothers me, and I'm going to get on my soapbox, if you don't mind moving aside for a moment, um, is that we don't think about physical illnesses as motivational problems. So when we have a, a patient who's got a cholesterol issue, the GP is going to say, take this medication. We're not actually trained in like motivational interviewing and to help people like, okay, like, like, cause we can, we can tell them, Hey, like you need to eat more fiber and eat less processed foods. And we provide them with information, but information doesn't create behavioral change. I, I want to say that 50 and I'm being conservative there on my heart of hearts, it's like 80% of the physical problems that we deal with are exactly what you're talking about. That that these problems, like you can take cholesterol medication every single day and it'll artificially lower your cholesterol. There'll be population-based studies that show that you are less likely to die of a heart attack. But these are population studies that the reason that cholesterol medication is so good is because you have a population of people who are not being taught how to live healthy lives. And I think we're seeing the same thing with psychopharmacology and psychiatry which is that someone once told me that, you know, you should, you should do a psychopharm clinic because it's operating at the top of your license. That you as a medical doctor, there are social workers, psychologists, PhDs that can all do psychotherapy, but you as a doctor are the only one that can prescribe. Therefore, if you want to do good in the world, you should prescribe the most medication possible. <laughs> and I thought that was ridiculous. I said, I don't think that's the top of my license at all. In fact, I think it's operating at the bottom of my license. My personal take is that operating at the top of a license as a psychiatrist is you're the one person that can combine the both. You're the one person that can actually recognize what the strengths and weaknesses of a medication is and to be able to integrate it into a long-term plan using things like psychotherapy or gut microbiome or like all kinds of other stuff that I think has awesome therapeutic value. And so, like, I, I'm with you. You know, so, I, so, I shall relieve my soapbox and, and right, give so you a you chance. Excellent performance. I want to pick out one thing from there before I forget it and then flick back to some of the other points you made. You basically said, look, some people will never go to the gym. You know, people are not going to fix their lives. They're not going to face all these big issues. So we may as well do what we can for them, like give them a statin or give them an antidepressant. I'll stick away from statin for a second. The only thing with The only problem with that is is if you're doing them more harm than good. So I'm not arguing if something, if this drug was a bit helpful, wasn't any side effects, mm. I would agree with everything you've just said, I would just nod along. But but there's a few things I, I'd add in there. Number one, there's something called uh, tardive dysphoria with antidepressants. This idea that long-term use of antidepressants can make depression worse. Now, I think, so I'll put my cards on the table. I think I absolutely had that. You know, I am, I am, the, the major difference between me now and me five years ago is I'm on less medication. I'm in a lot better mood than I was on medication. I think there's a few ways it could work. One, SSRIs disrupt sleep architecture. In every study, your normal sleep architecture, stage one, two, three, four, REM, is disrupted. That's why people often don't dream when they're on antidepressants because REM is, is, is uh, inhibited. It also affects slow wave sleep. In some studies, they say this must be the mechanism of action. But if you look at it, it's showing disrupted sleep. People have impaired concentration and memory, as I had very badly on these drugs. And that may be professionally not very good, socially uh, self-conscious. The fact that I've got my memory and concentration back has made me a lot more confident as a human being. Uh, and people would also, some people suggest there's a directly toxic effect. And if you think about these drugs being a bit like MDMA, not as strong, much a smaller dose, but someone taking a small dose of a recreational drug every day, what do you think about them over years? They're not happy you know, go lucky people. They're people that have some sort of impairment. Think about the yeah, alcohol. I, and well, there's some recent studies. I know that microdosing uh, psychedelics has been very popular among some people, but there are some studies I think recently that came out that show that it basically is harmful. So, right. I mean, you, you, look, I guess my step back is, you know, these are chemicals. They're they're exogenous to the to the body. They're going to have abnormal effects on the brain. You know, they're not. That's why that's why the story about low serotonin and these drugs fixing it is very seductive. It makes them sound natural you know replacing insulin with insulin sounds to me very sensible low serotonin with serotonin it's very sensible. but if you, if you step away from that and there is no low serotonin then these drugs are, are changing the the chemistry of the brain and we know 
from recreational drugs, which I think we're a lot more honest about. We know that that's likely to have negative effects in the long term because we're fiddling with a system that was evolved over millennia. So that's where I would problematize this idea. Well, if you can't do anything for them, you may as well do this. I would say, and this is really hard for doctors, if you can't do anything useful for them, at least don't do them any harm. So I think a very sensible response is, I can't do anything for you. There are no drugs that are going to fix this. You know, wait and see. Sounds like all the things that you're talking about are these 19 other treatments and other things. That sounds all very useful. But just to do something, and if you, if you ask doctors, you know, why do you prescribe? A lot of them say that I want to do something. You know, doctors want to help, but also can do guys. You know, in the emergency department, if someone's having a heart attack, you want you want a guy who's going to jump on you and shock you. You don't want a guy who's going to say, oh, let's wait and see. But I think in this, there's a great book written by a Harvard psychiatrist, much older than you, called House of God. Uh, that's the, that's his earlier book. The other book is Mount Misery. And he says his line is, don't just do something, stand there. It's a great line. And I think it's really important in psychiatry. That Completely someone, agree. House of God is fantastic, by the way. Y'all should definitely check it out. It's, what, it's where Scrubs came from. But Mount Misery is the sequel, maybe even better, deeper about his time in, in training in, in McLean Hospital in, uh, in, in Harvard. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we, we want to be able to fix everything. We want to think that we're brilliant neuroscience. We can fiddle with things. I think we have to accept life is very hard. Doctors are not the all powerful people they like to think of themselves as. And we have to accept our limitations rather than thinking we can fix things. I think that's a very potentially dangerous idea to have in our heads. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple other questions, Mark, um, and I, I think we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. So one thing that I'm just kind of noticing, and I hope this is okay, is that so, so you're someone who was diagnosed with treatment-resistant depression. And when I talk to you, I get the sense that you're on a crusade. Is that fair? Look, I think, uh, look, I feel that I have suffered a lot. I haven't gone into it. I had a lot of illness. I had a lot of health problems on these drugs for many years, mainly tiredness, uh, memory problems, and uh, uh, concentration issues, which caused me huge amounts of trouble. I worked part-time. It cost me relationships. It was a big thing. Since I've come off the drugs, I've realized that a lot of those problems were due to the drugs. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I guess I've had, I feel like the lens has been removed from my eyes and I can see a lot of issues that people have are because of their drugs, adverse effects that are, that are not well recognized, that are withdrawal effects from their drugs that are not well recognized. So if I had had trouble coming off this drug and that was it, I would have gone away and kept, kept going. It was seeing that there was endless people around me with similar problems that made me think this wasn't just bad luck for me, an idiosyncratic reaction for me. This is a systemic problem. And I think that's what got me a bit activated, that it wasn't just me. Because I, I, I sort of say, I've had reactions to antibiotics before. I'm not talking about antibiotics are terrible because I don't think that. I've just, you know, I've just re-examined, uh, you know, antidepressants. It made me, you know, I, it's a, sort of a lucky thing. I happen to have a PhD in the area. I'm a training psychiatrist. I had the expertise to look at it. I do think it's a human rights issue. Uh, you're, you're right. I, I am, you know, there's an activist uh, a corner to my work because I think that because doctors and the public don't understand the risks of these drugs, you know, and minimal benefits, that a lot of harm is being done to people with long-term treatment, in children, in, in, in women uh, of, of childbearing age that are not being looked at clearly because of... Uh, a kind of a paradigm that science and these drugs will fix things and it causes people not to look at these issues in, in great depth so yes i definitely think there's a human rights issue here you know i am i am a campaigner as well as a researcher and that's because i think there's uh, there, there are things that can be improved in our health system and i you know i happen to have insight into it through my own experience and my and my research so so one thing that i'm kind of curious about and hope let me know if i overstep here is that i'm kind of noticing that as you've discovered that so you had this idea that, okay, there's something broken in me. And then someone is like, here's a pill, Mark. Take it and your problems will be solved. And then you trusted that doctor in that moment. And that caused you a ton of hurt, right? It, it stalled your progress in a lot of ways. It sounds like you've been struggling with this for a long time. It sounds like you're still dealing with the problems of tapering off of SSRIs. And, and so it's kind of interesting, right? Because now you've sort of discovered that, okay, I've, I've never been broken. I've never been broken. And that thought in and of itself kind of pulls you out of the depression some, that there's not something fundamentally wrong with me. The, the demon here is the medication. And I have to fix my own problems. 
So one of the things that I'm kind of curious about is like, so when I'm listening to this, there are two kind of concerns that I have. These are a little bit more personal in nature. Let me know if this is kind of out, out of uh, uh, out of bounds of what's appropriate. One is that if there is evidence that you are wrong, what that means is that your worldview changes, right? Because now we go back <clears throat> to where we were. And so what I'm kind of curious about, I, I totally think you're on an awesome crusade. We, we love having you here. We're going to talk in a minute. I'm going to ask a little bit more about details about the work that you're doing and the clinic you're opening and stuff like that. So we, we absolutely like, you know, think I love your paper in molecular psychiatry. And at the same time, when I talk to someone who's a crusader, it's been my experience that sometimes those people actually will ignore evidence, that they will find the, the, the rigor with which they approach poking studies that fit with their worldview is different from the rigor with which they approach because you were wronged, right? And then like that psychological hurt has caused you so much. You were told you're broken and you've never been broken. And I just get a little bit concerned, honestly, and that's why I'm sharing with you. I'm, I'm really curious kind of what you think yeah. about this, that you, you know, you kind of say like, well, I'm st stating facts. And you kind of, even when you say that, it sort of implies that other doctors who are offering con informed consent in a different way are not stating facts. And they have studies to back themselves up too, right? You just happen to think that those studies are more wrong than the studies that you believe in. And there are good methodol methodological reasons. You've got a PhD in the topic. I'm not kind of disputing that. But I'm curious, like, you know, this crus the crusader in you makes me concerned that you can't afford to be wrong here. And that if so, there is therapeutic value to SSRIs, I'm concerned that you could be discounting it to some degree based on your personal experience with this. Because sure. And the yeah. last thing is that, you know, you can go look for basically any problem on the Internet. And by virtue of the Internet, you're going to be able to you're going to be able to find an echo chamber of people who have SSRI withdrawal. I'm not saying that SSRI withdrawal isn't real, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting that like what really got you on this journey was basically like, you know, there are sequestered places on the Internet where people talk about SSRI withdrawal and, uh, you know, how psychiatry has harmed them. And I think psychiatry can absolutely be harmful for sure. Um, and so I'm just a little bit concerned about that. I'm curious if you kind of thought about that. How do you kind of approach that? Of course, I thought about that. So I'd say I'd, I'll, I'll talk generally and I'll talk about me in particular. So everybody has a bias. So you I mean, you're part of what is happening here is you're defending your practice you know, against me. I'm I'm you're, I'm I'm on. You agree with what I'm saying. Some of what I'm saying challenges what you're saying. You're defending it because you want to think that you're you know uh, you're a clever guy. You're a hardworking guy. You want to you want to feel that you're doing the right things for patients. And of course, you're just an example of the broader profession. And, and it, you know, everyone wants to feel they're doing the right thing. So of course, you know, professors of of psychiatry uh, don't want to say that what they've been working on for 20 years is wrong. So they, they have a lot invested in you know their integrity and their consistency, you know, and often their mortgages. So everybody has you know, everybody's position gives them a certain bias. Um, you know, maybe my bias is is a bit more um, evident because I'm trying to get my message across here in, in very quick segments. So I'm you know talking with with gusto, but I mean of course you know I think everybody has brings some bias to the table. Um, you know, that is that is inherent to being a human, whether it's professional bias or personal bias. I mean, I guess the scientific literature, you know, takes that into account. You know, you, you can't just publish, you know, an essay. This is Mark. This is what I think about stuff. That's what you put on a blog. You know, when you when you submit scientific evidence, it has to be with a with a clear methodology. It has to be seen by peer reviewers in order to maybe not eliminate, but minimize bias. So if I if I write a paper about risk factors around investment withdrawal. Okay, yes, I've experienced it, but I'm I'm using the data that I've collected from different studies and I put it together. And if reviewers think I'm being biased, they'll tell me and they'll and they'll and I'll have to respond to get it published. So, you know, the idea behind you know the publication process is to eliminate personal bias, which of course is a universal issue. Uh, that's that's the kind of general answer that everyone has bias and there are ways to to try to to manage it. And I I would say I'd use the antibiotic example. You know, I've had, I've been nauseous from antibiotics. I'm not here telling you antibiotics are terrible. What happened to me was that I was jolted out of my, of my paradigm because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I would have, I probably would have been more, you know, I would have been more biologically minded than you are. I would have been saying this is what I've been taught. 
I've seen the meta analyses. Um, you know, I was a, I guess I'd be a regular biopsychosocial. You know, I pass all the exams. Uh, I had an experience that made me re-examine the, the studies. And it wasn't me having withdrawal effects that made me critical. It was me reading, you know, critical uh, work, different views, and slowly the penny, you know, drops that things that I had thought were absolutely true were not as clear. So, you know, I feel like I've been pushed on a journey by my experience. You know, but I, I, I am talking to you facts when I say 70% of people have been diagnosed with depression. That's not my opinion. You know, I can send you the, the reference. So, you know, not, not saying, diagnosed with depression. 70% of people meet criteria. Meet criteria sorry, you're right. right? There's criteria. a big difference there. Yes, yes sorry, meet criteria. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I would say, look, if it turned out that for a small proportion of people, antidepressants were very effective and it, it, you know, it matched their biology in some way, you know, I would take that into account. I think, you know, looking at what's happened so far, the effects are very small. I'm not saying it shouldn't be used for anybody. I'm not a, a complete... Uh, unmovable on that that idea i'm i'm looking at you know what exists what studies show comparing the benefits and the harms so let, let me just uh, ask a question about that so we do have studies right so you're saying that the purpose of peer review is to remove bias so we have studies rcts that show that ssris are effective for people correct or incorrect we have studies that those are the published results so look uh, I, I don't know how much longer you have but but you know, there's a few things, there are study, there are lots of studies that show, I mean, there, there's meta-analysis, you don't have to talk about studies, there's studies that put all the studies together, and they show that antidepressants uh, are statistically significantly more effective than placebo at six to eight weeks. That That is, I don't, I don't debate that. There are several problems with those studies that mean that, whether, that, that means that that doesn't have a lot of relevance in the real world. And I'll just give you, I'll summarize it in 60 seconds. One, they go for six weeks. People get their drugs for months or years. Benzos are effective at six weeks. Opioids, maybe even alcohol for social anxiety would be benefit, beneficial at six weeks. That doesn't say very much at all about years or months. People before those studies start are taken off other antidepressants often, and withdrawal effects can affect the people in the placebo group. Uh, the two-point difference between people in placebo and in, in with antidepressants has been thought by most people to be not clinically significant. In other words, it's too small a difference to make a difference. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. So, 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 but, but, but this is my point, right? So when we when we kind of say, okay, the purpose of peer reviewed studies is to remove bias from the equation. It's not perfect. It's not. Perfect. It's not perfect, of course, right? And and I'm I'm with you. I don't disagree with any of your criticisms. I'm just kind of noticing that, like, when there are peer reviewed studies suggesting that antidepressants are effective. Right. This is where you add all of the caveats. And I think you've got good reason for it. So I'm, I'm totally with you. <clears throat> I, I'm just kind of pointing out that like and I'm not pro SSRI or anything like that. It, it, you know, I, I think it's just it, it's interesting because I think when you kind of talk about this personal crusade, the penny dropped, that seems to me to be like a very, very I'm not criticizing it, but like that's got to shape the way that you see things. Right, because you're right. You're not out here crusading against antibiotics because there isn't a personal, this is who I am and I was broken. And once we sort of add that to the equation, it changes the way that you're kind of approaching this whole issue. I, I, would, I would say this. I mean, for example, there are lots of academics who say antidepressants have uh, you know, changed my life or, or I've seen it, it you know, help my patients. And of course, all of those people are then going to bring very strong biases to their interpretation. So absolutely, you know, I'm just I'm just noting that you're bringing this up to someone who's criticizing studies where you're used to these studies not being criticized. You know, in 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 uh, in mass general. So I, I, oh, I just hold on. Where, where do you get that assumption? Well, you know, I I, I mean, I so I haven't seen you know <laughs> your channel, but I, I guess all of the questions you're asking me, you know, would apply to any professor standing up and saying, uh, you know, these antidepressants definitely work. You know, they all they all have certain uh, maybe they're better at hiding it. Maybe I'm a bit uh, my, wearing my heart on my sleeve here. Uh, but you know, they, they're all going to bring certain biases uh, to their uh, to their presentations. And I, a lot of what I'm saying, I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk more about the antidepressant studies because it's a very interesting, uh, you know, area how how these studies are conducted and what they actually show versus how people interpret them. You know, these these are studies that are done by other people. I, I'm 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 recounting to you some of these uh, findings. Uh, but, you know, these are, this has been done yeah. by pop groups. So so it's hardly, you know, in other words, I, I don't accept the premise that I've got some idiosyncratic view of the literature. You know, these are views held by a lot of scientists. Uh, you know, I, no, I agree. I, 
I, with your points. I, 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 I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. So so I don't think your view is idiosyncratic. And you're right that I'm applying the same standard to you that I... And this is what Jerry... This is the standard that Jerry Rosenbaum taught me to apply, which is like when someone... And, you know, he's... And, and that's what's great. I mean, I, I really appreciate my training. I think my training there is very instrumental to the way that I approach SSRIs. I don't have anywhere near the experience or expertise in the subject that you do. But even looking at studies and recognizing bias. So you're right that I'm applying the same standard to you that I think we we apply to people with SSRIs and and so, or who are pro SSRIs are talking about those studies. My point is simply that there's a bias. I mean, I'm detecting, and it doesn't mean you're wrong, right? It just means that you're passionate. And oftentimes, I think most of the advances that we have in psychiatry actually come out of people who are actually heavily biased. And, and people who believe in something, right? So if we look at something like Marshall Linehan and dialectical behavioral therapy, and it's not uncommon for the leaders in the field of psychiatry to struggle with these problems themselves, find actually that treatment is insufficient, and then look for something better. And what they bring back to us is exactly what I, I think you're doing here, which is awesome, which is like, hey, this didn't work for me. And I looked at it, I know what I'm talking about. Here's what I think. And this is kind of my view. And I think it's great. I think that it's just interesting because I'm curious. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of those studies too. I fall on the side of being like, I think SSRIs are way oversold. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to point that out and was curious yeah, about no, that. It's a fair point. I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't think that's my message. I'm not saying antidepressants didn't work for me. So you guys shouldn't do it either. That's, you know, that would be, yeah. I think that would be an irresponsible message. You know, I'm not, yep, you yep. know, it would be a reasonable That's thing. That's not to the say. message I think we got for you. I, I think the me message we got from you is. I'm, I guess I'm saying, you know, and, and I and I take your, your point, you know, I guess I'm saying I was forced to reappraise what I'd been taught in an unusual way that I wouldn't normally have done, you know, and what I found, I found disturbing. You know, I found it to be different to what I'd been taught and you know, it was that understanding that I think has propelled me. If I just had a bad time on antidepressants, you know, I get some people love Coca-Cola, some people hate it. You know, I get that. I guess, you know, I'm I'm here, I'm on this uh, stream because, you know, I think people should be aware of the issues with, with these studies much more than they already are. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you, we have one question from the audience and then we'll give you a chance to kind of tell us a little bit about your work. Does that work for you? Is it okay? So, um, so people are a little bit curious about uh, PMDD, so premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, uh, so I, I guess we've had a couple of comments about how people have found SSRIs to be very, very helpful in helping them manage PMDD. Do you have any thoughts about that or how that could be, you know, because this is a different pathophysiology we're talking about. We're not talking about a serotonin deficiency. Yeah. Do you think that there may be value to SSRIs for people with PMDD? So, so I can't say I'm an, I'm an expert in PMDD, but, you know, I would say this, antidepressants are used for about 45 different conditions, anxiety, depression, pain, PMDD, chronic fatigue, that itself should make people think there are very few other medications that are used in 45 different conditions. You know, it's a, it, 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 what it suggests is that there, there is a non-specific mode of action. Because if it works for PMDD as well as other things, it suggests that there's something not specific about PMDD, and it comes down to is it working through something like numbing or reducing uh, the intensity of emotions, which would apply to almost any emotion and to pain. And so I think that the fact that it's being used, you know, most blood pressure medications are used for blood pressure and diabetes for diabetes. Very few drugs are used for a whole range of different disorders, and I think that points to the non-specific mechanism. That's that's, that's, a, that, that's a great, I love that answer. So so just to kind of bounce that back. So if we look at SSRIs, there isn't this, um, it, it, or you know, you don't think that there's this kind of like magic bullet thing where there's serotonin deficiency in the brain. There's this highly specific mechanism of action and that uh, uh, SSRIs fix this problem. What, what they do do, and we have good evidence of this, right? You so, sort of said 50 to 70% of people in one study are in a meta-analysis. Notice that there's emotional numbing. And so you're, what you're kind of saying is that if we look at all these conditions, like let's say fibromyalgia, even things like post-stroke recovery, there's there's trials that show that SSRIs improve the rate at which people recover from strokes. Um, and and uh, I, I haven't, it's not my area of expertise. It's, you know, just a couple mm -hmm. of studies I've seen. Um, 
and PMDD that there is a non-specific action, which could be something as simple as numbing, which sounds like that's the thing that you are the most convinced that SSRIs do, which is numb stuff. And that there may be a therapeutic use for that in a variety of conditions, but it's not like it's a silver bullet for anything else. Is that a fair representation of what you said? Mostly. I mean, I, I would say, you know, yes, that seems to be the most obvious effect of these drugs. There are all sorts of hypothesized biological mechanisms. And I think what's important is that people understand that, for example, if you're, you know, to, 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 to send back what you've just said, you know, if you tell someone this drug will fix a chemical imbalance, or it'll be some sort of key, they're not going to stop it. You know, why would they, why would they say yeah. no to it? If they're told that this might numb them, they're probably going to think it's a short term solution. It's not a real deep solution. So yes, you know, if, if you took one thing from all the things I've talked about, I think that letting people, the public know that that may be the way it works, will, will they might use the drug still. I'm not going to prevent anyone from doing that. They may think about it differently because, you know, it's the difference between giving someone a sling for a broken arm and an operation. You know, no one's going to say no to a sling, but they might think about it differently, especially long term. Yeah, completely agree. And and just to wrap up, uh, Mark, any questions for me, actually? I, I know I've been... Uh, no, no, it's, it's been, it's been, I'm going to watch some of your videos now. I've, I've, uh, I've got an insight into your world. It sounds very interesting. You've got a very uh, uh, careful way of looking at things, which I appreciate. So I'll, I'll watch your, your videos. Did, did, was there anything that I said that you felt was kind of out of line or, or that? No, no, no. I, I understand. Obviously, the, 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 the last set of questions, I understand why you asked them. And, and I, uh, people, of course, said that to me before. Uh, you know, I bring my personal experience front and center because I don't want to, I don't want to seem like, um, I mean, in the ivory tower saying, you know, all of you are weak for using these drugs and, you know, you've got to face the hard stuff in life. You know, I feel like I'm in the same boat as everybody else. And I, and I want to make that clear. So I'm not just a guy, you know, in an academic building somewhere writing, writing things down. So I, you know, I do think that my personal experience gives me, you know, an insight into things. And that's why I bring it to the table. Absolutely. Um, so do you want to just tell us a little bit about, so it sounds like you do some work at the NHS, but then you've got a couple of other things that you're kind of working on. You mentioned you're opening up a clinic in the U.S. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, I, I co-founded Outro Health uh, with some uh, Canadian uh, entrepreneurs who have run different medical clinics before. Uh, most of the founding group have themselves come off antidepressants and had trouble with it. And we're essentially trying to build something uh, that involves the sort of care that we couldn't find. I mean, you've heard I had to work it out myself. Uh, one of the people involved is a woman called Adele Framer, who founded Surviving Antidepressants. And she gives advice to people on how to safely stop antidepressants because she couldn't find medical care. It sounds like you may be an exception who's very uh, diligent on these things. But most doctors, you know, are still taking people off these drugs very quickly in a linear way. And we know that can cause people all sorts of trouble, especially when withdrawal symptoms aren't recognized. And so we've built a system that we've piloted in Canada where we help people to come off gradually in the ways that I've described in this hyperbolic way, taking account of the different uh, effects of small doses, using things like liquid versions of the drugs. We provide you know, wraparound support. We have specialized nurse practitioners and counselors. Um, and we want to bring that to America next year, probably in California. Uh, and people can already see there is there's some uh, information on Outro Health online. Uh, and we hope that we can help with Americans as, as I've helped in my clinic in England and, and we've done some work in Canada. And do you all have studies about this sort of methodology that you use? Absolutely. So we're, we're, we will publish a, um, a paper on the, the pilot that we've done with 50 people uh, next year. And there's already some studies out there about, if you want to talk about hyperbolic tapering in particular, there's a Dutch group that have already done some work taking people who couldn't come off their drugs uh, in the sort of linear, quick fashion with their doctors, who when given the capacity to make smaller changes over a longer period of time using compounded medications called tapering strips, they've shown that 85% uh, of people, none of whom could get off before with their, with their doctors could come off. Hmm. And I'm also part of a randomized controlled trial in Australia comparing hyperbolic tapering to care as usual. It'll take a couple of years to get done. Uh, and there's, there's people around Europe now doing similar trials. So there'll be more and more research in this area, which, of course, is what will make change people's minds. Of course. So but just just to clarify, so it sounds like y'all don't have a it sounds like y'all are going to publish a peer reviewed pilot next year. Exactly. exactly. OK, 
but based on your clinical experience and your personal experience that that and all of the basic science behind it you're very convinced that this is very effective so so no you know take my opinion for it i wouldn't i wouldn't ask you to do that it's now the national guidelines in england so okay. i talked i talked about um how the the guidelines in america and england up until a couple of years ago and canada all said to come off the drugs slowly that's no longer the case in the uk so there was a a complete change in the guidelines last year where they now say some of the things that i told you to come off over months or years come down to very small doses using liquids often to less than a milligram at a rate that the person can tolerate that's the guidelines from the royal college of psychiatrists and it's also the guidelines from NICE. Mm. So that's not just for psychiatrists, it's for GPs as well. Awesome. In, in England, the public health system has put a call out for increased services to help people stop antidepressants because they've recognized there's an issue with overprescribing. Uh, and so we are essentially applying what is now standard practice in England. It hasn't come yet to North America. The, the, uh, there's been no change in the guidelines according to the research as it has been in the UK, and we're bringing that, I guess, that progress in the UK to America uh, and, and, and North America. So I'm just a, a, a tiny bit confused. So you said there are changes in, in the UK. So there there's this Dutch group that's done this research. So this the changes in the guidelines in the UK were based on the research from the Dutch people, or what's that based on? So the UK, so in the UK, you know, every 10 years, they review the guidelines. So there's been actually two guidelines on this topic. One is a guideline on safe withdrawal of drugs of dependence and withdrawal, which includes antidepressants. And the other one is in the depression guidelines. And so they get so a committee uh, in the UK government uh, goes to gets uh, performs a systematic review performs they get a committee together of GPs, psychiatrists, members of the public, and they generate a guideline. And based on based so on Mark, hold on a second. So, like, you're telling me that you guys follow the UK guidelines, but the UK yeah. guidelines are people sitting around a table, expert opinion, the same way we wound up with the DSM? No, no, it's a very different process. I don't know if you're familiar with guideline developments. Yeah. So, DSM was not a guide. Was not a DSM was a consensus document. You know, I can, I can, I can show. You there's a, there's a 584 page systematic review underlying the Nice guidelines. So okay. they, so you know, they. There are rules. You can't have conflicts of interest. It's it's an independent UK. Uh, um, what I'm curious about, Mark, is is what studies when they talk about hyperbolic tapering. So I yeah. and and maybe this is I'm belaboring a point. And but so it sounds like there's a lot of research being done. But if they've yes. implemented guidelines, that would imply that there are peer reviewed studies that show that hyperbolic tapering is effective. So what they do is they they use the hierarchy of evidence. You know, which you'll be familiar with. Start yeah. With. Analyses, with systematic reviews, randomized controlled trials. Of course. So in, in the field of antidepressant deprescribing at the moment, you know, there are no meta-analyses, there are no systematic reviews. The the studies that they found, I can I can show you, I can show you some of the highlights of what they found. Uh, they found there's two randomized controlled trials that compared four-week tapering and an abrupt tapering. They found one that, that compared two-week tapering to abrupt tapering, which showed no difference. There are observational studies that show that tapering over several months reduces withdrawal effects and relapse. Mark, hold on a second. So yes, yes. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding or... So you wrote a paper in molecular psychiatry that was yes. a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. That's like That's good something. evidence, right? That's when you guys said, look, if we look at all of this data, we have facts, let's say, that the serotonin hypothesis of depression does not have good scientific support. So just to, just to understand this, th that's not what we're talking about with hyperbolic tapering. What we're talking about with hyperbolic tapering is that you're very convinced it works and there are UK guidelines, but it sounds like there are not meta-analyses that this is effective and that yeah. those studies are, I mean, there are RCTs, you guys have a pilot. I just want to make sure that we're, I understand that. That's fine, that's fine. There's no meta-analysis okay. of hyperbolic tapering because there are no randomized controlled trials of right. hyperbolic tapering. So, we're so the, the, main, the main, from what I can tell from the, the NICE guidelines committee, the main rationale is a biological rationale. So after understanding that very small doses have, you know, almost half the effect of large doses, 
it's hard to ask people to do linear tapering. So, you know, you, you, if you think through the hierarchy of evidence, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with think, you. So, so you what, know, what you, I'm, what I'm hearing is that there's very, very strong basic science evidence. There is very, very strong, let's say, observational evidence, which means studies. And there's, and there's, and there's no published randomized control trials. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, happy to be very clear about that. That's, yes, that's, that's the state of the science. You know, we we published sure. a paper on hyperbolic tapering in 2019. That was the first paper about it. And where four years later, it's you know, it's exciting. There's a couple of studies, but yes, there's nothing published on randomized controlled trials. That that is that is the state at the moment. And and you're right. But, the main the main rationale, you know, is is on a biological rationale. For it's very hard to make the argument uh, that that going down in a linear way makes sense after seeing what the effect of the drugs is on the brain. Absolutely right. So so like you still feel that this is the right thing to do. You have a lot of basic science understanding of this. We understand how things get metabolized. We also, based on this sort of knocking down this serotonin hypothesis of depression, it opens up a new way to think about why people have relapses or recurrences of depression after they taper SSRIs. Everything that you've said still stands. It just sounds like when we're really talking about, you know, are there RCTs that show that this is effective? We're really in the early stages of that because we've just sort of figured out the basic science. There are clinical protocols that are being implemented, clinical protocols that seem to be effective. And now we've reached the RCT stage, which is where we're at. Fair? Yeah. Ab absolutely. There's, awesome. there's, not, there's, not, there's not RCTs. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you the, the, so the observational trials are what you could think of as uh, uh, same uh, retrospective studies with the person having experienced before tapering according to their GPs and now with the hyperbolic tapering. And so it's not a randomized trial, but what it is is a, for an individual, they've tried it both different ways. They sure. said to their own control. It, it's, I, it's of course, I, not, not doesn't meet the level of an RCT, but yes, you're exactly right in, 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 your, in your grasp of what, what the existing evidence is. Yeah, and I think one of the most confusing things, so I see this a lot in complementary and alternative medicine. You know, if you look at something like meditation, so meditation is now an evidence-based intervention for all kinds of stuff, depression, anxiety, whatever. Sure. But if you really think about it, 50 years ago, there was a lot of pushback that meditation worked. A lot of people said, hey, I meditated. It's helped me a lot. You know, it really does work. And oftentimes what happens is the discovery actually precedes the randomized control trial. And meditation has worked for 3,000 years. The only thing is now we have evidence for it because we actually systematically studied it. But that doesn't mean that, you know, I think this is something that people miss a lot, is that oftentimes the discoveries of what works predate the evidence of what works. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, it, you know I, I, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in both camps. I absolutely, you know, I'm a, I'm a follower of evidence-based medicine. I think it's it's utterly important we do randomized controlled trials. That's why I'm very happy to be part yeah. of one in Australia. I also think that after you see the way the drugs affect the brain, it's very hard to make the argument we should be halving halving in and stopping. I mean, sure, I, sure. You know, I, Come, I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, oversell what the existing evidence is. I think there's, there's gaps, uh, but I also think that the rationale is strong. You know, I think in part the committee was also affected by um, how widespread hyperbolic tapering is amongst people coming off in peer-led communities. So if you go, if you go online, you'll see the, sure. the story. It's, not, it's, you know, I know it's, it's anecdotal. But the story is, I went to my doctor, I came off over four weeks, I was a screaming mess. I've come off over a year, you know, I'm not a screaming mess. It's, yeah. You know, it's something. I agree. I, look, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to get away from. No, I, 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 th I think there's a beautiful follow up discussion to be had about how seriously should we form guidelines based on what people say on the internet. It, you know, I think this is where as academics will be very paternalistic about it. We'll say, oh, like that's a low level of evidence. But like, you know, a lot of people, I mean, when I've got problems, I don't, you know, uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there, and I, I think it's a great discussion. Anyway, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. I can see that it was light outside when we started, and it's dark outside today. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on this stuff. I think it's a, really a revolutionary idea that you have. I think there, there seems to be just budding and growing evidence to support it. Um, I think it mirrors a lot of what I've seen in clinical practice. Uh, I, I think it really speaks to this idea that we have in psychiatry where, like, you know, pharmacology is a very valuable tool for harm reduction or population-based health. Not even in psychiatry, I mean in medicine in general. But there's a big difference between harm reduction and fixing your problems. 
and and so thank you so much for the work that you've, you've been doing. Thank you so much for the research that you've been putting out. Um, you know, I my clinical practice has absolutely been influenced by the papers that you've published. And so I'm really grateful for that as a clinician. And I hope that my patients are better because of the stuff that you have chosen to publish. And so thank you for that on behalf of my patients. And I think there's one patient in mind that I have right now that, that I think I'm going to kind of reference this talk and, and I'm, I'm really curious about what they think. So it's, thank thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. It's been great talking to you. You've pushed me. You've been very detailed. I've enjoyed it. So thanks very much. Do you want to just tell us for people who are interested in learning more, where can they find more information about you or you have a website so, or like? I've got a slightly dinky website, uh, www.markhorowitz.org. I'm on Twitter uh, at Mark Horow, H-O-R-O. -O. Uh, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, cheers. Take thanks care and good luck with all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye. All righty. The meeting has been left. All right. What'd y'all think, chat? So that was great. I loved it. But ha did y'all follow the second half better? Let's start there. Yeah. So it, his his papers are good. But I, I think it's important. <laughs> Some of it's facts. But we actually don't have trials that show that the hyperbolic tapering is... Very. I mean, we don't we don't have trials of that, right? So I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. Doesn't mean that it's not going to work because we didn't have trials that meditation was effective long before it was, and people were doing it. So I think there's just some fundamental problems with evidence based medicine that we sometimes don't quite acknowledge. There are even papers and evidence based medicine critiques of evidence based medicine. But I think what's really great about evidence based medicine, I think the reason that it's better than everything else, is that well, it's not better than. Everything. There are parts of it that are superior to everything. Uh, the thing that it does the best at is we learn from our mistakes in a very, very good way. So I was at a conference at Harvard, and one of my mentors was speaking there. And the, the conference was on complementary and alternative medicine. And so someone asked the question, like, why do you think it is that Western medicine or allopathic medicine or scientific medicine or biological medicine, whatever you want to call it, has dominated the world. And some of these other traditional systems of medicine like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine are not as popular. And a lot of people may say, well, that's because evidence-based medicine works and those other things don't work. That's pretty wrong, I'm pretty sure. So for example, a lot of our best treatments in evidence-based medicine actually come from those medical traditions, including statin drugs which are derived from a Chinese medicine called red yeast rice. But anyway, and so what, what my mentor said, which I thought was brilliant, was the biggest problem with like Eastern systems of medicine is that y'all don't let things fail, right? So if you look at Ayurveda, very rarely, I don't think I've ever seen a paper where people in Ayurveda will say, this actually doesn't work. We were wrong. For 5,000 years, we've been practicing this way, and it turns out that we're wrong. The one thing that evidence-based medicine is very good at is that we will say, hey, you should do this thing. And we'll give you a pill. We'll say this pill will fix your problems. But then 20 years later, we'll actually look at that and we'll decide, you know what? This was a mistake and we correct it. And so the strongest thing, what I love about the scientific approach to medicine is that we actually are pretty good at catching our mistakes over time, including the mistakes of our system of medicine which is like clinical trials. There are shortcomings to clinical trials. And so I, I think, you know, I encourage y'all to, to learn more about this stuff. And I absolutely think that in psychiatry, like the basic problem is that we have a population-based approach and we have a harm reduction-based approach. So when we look at psychiatry, we don't try to cure things. We gave up the battle on cure. And now it's about how can we mitigate the damage that is done by mental illness, even if mental illness exists, which in some ways it absolutely does. So if we look at some things like schizophrenia, for example, there's a lot of like very good brain scan evidence that this is a pathology within the brain. But at some point, what happened is we had a lot of people who were sick and we didn't have enough people to treat them. And this problem is going to get worse, by the way. So the number of psychiatrists right now, half of them are over the age of 55. 
And in our lifetimes, there will be less psychiatric care, even though problems like depression and anxiety are skyrocketing through the roof. More psychiatrists will retire in the next 20 years than will be trained. So this problem is just going to get worse. And when you have too few psychiatrists for too many patients, and you can't sit down and get into the details of what's wrong with someone, what you can do is a harm reduction approach. I can't get into the weeds with everybody. But what I can do is give everyone a pill. And for a third of people, it'll do nothing. For a third of people, it'll help a little bit. And for a third of people, it'll help a decent amount. Now, Dr. Horowitz says, in addition to that, that's actually bad because there's an assumption that SSRIs are generally speaking a safe and well-tolerated medication, right? And, and he's claiming that there's a lot of damage that gets done from SSRIs. So maybe it's actually a bad idea. Maybe we're not, it's not harm reduction if the SSRI is actually damaging. It's, you're not reducing any harm because we're creating harm elsewhere. And so this is a huge problem. And I think like our take, I mean, my take on mental health, and I have a bias too, by the way. My bias was that I spent seven years studying to become a monk before I went to med school. So I remember being a PGY2 and in a psychotherapy lecture where people were telling me, this is how the mind works. They were like, this is the fact of how the mind works. And it was based on, you know, what Sigmund Freud figured out and Carl Jung figured out and stuff like that, as well as lots of other, you know, scientific studies and stuff like that. And in the back of my mind, I was like, wait, that's not how it works. In the East, they believe that the mind works a different way. And I had to go through 16 lectures on psychotherapy to understand how the mind works. Because there are all these complicated theories about, you know, suppressed emotions manifesting in dreams and like this kind of like, you know, there's cognitions and behaviors. And this is also why the behaviorists grew so much because everyone was developing these super complicated theories about what's going on in the mind. And the behaviorists were like, we have no idea if that's actually true or not. So we're going to focus on behavior and changing behavior and what works for that. And so there are a lot of problems. And my bias is that like, I learned this different system of the mind, which I think is better. Like, I'm going to state that clearly. I think it's objectively better. I know it's kind of weird. And why is it objectively better? Because it is based on subjectivity, which is kind of weird. What does that mean? So the yogi sat down, and, and I don't know if this makes sense, and I'm going on rant here, but here's the basic problem with the Western model of the mind. The Western model of the mind is based on conversation. So what happened is you had a person like Freud talking to another human being. And based on their words, Freud constructed a model of the mind based on language. But Freud never had the ability to x-ray your mind. And we still don't. And so then all you have to ask yourself is what is the gap between what someone says and what is in their mind? Huge. And we are so good in psychiatry that we can actually bridge that gap a lot of the way. But in the East, how do they develop their model of mind? They looked within their own mind. They actually measured their own thoughts because the only person who can measure your thoughts is you. And the reason that I like this Eastern model of the mind is because it's based, it's from the viewpoint that you yourself will be in, right? So anything that we construct from the outside is great if you're sitting on the outside, but it doesn't help the person who's on the inside. So the yogis developed a model of the mind that is based on being inside your head and where do thoughts come from? Where do desires come from? And that's why I think it's so much more robust. There's a critical flaw in that mo model, by the way, which is that it's subjective, right? It's based on my own things. And just because I can see my own thoughts doesn't necessarily mean that I understand what is going on in my mind. That's the core problem. And that's what's so cool about yoga is what they sort of figured out is how do we remove the subjective bias from our own mind? And that's when they discovered this process of meditation to transcend your mind, to move beyond mind so that you can look at it from the outside. It's literally what they do. The observing self. There are studies about this. And even like brain scans and things like that of people who have, have done things, everything from die to try psychedelics. And we've seen what kind of happens when people have this subjective experience of looking at yourself from the outside. And I think the reason that it's better is because I found it to be more helpful for people. 
there's another good reason for that, which is maybe I'm a worse therapist than I am at teaching med meditation, right? So then I'm going to come down on the side. Maybe I'm just a bad therapist. That's one explanation for why I don't think it's as good. If I'm crappy at baking pizzas and I'm like, yeah, pizza sucks, but I'm really good at making soup, I'm like, soup is objectively better. That's one reason I could believe this, right? Maybe I just suck at therapy. Anyway, if you guys want to learn more about this stuff, you know, Dr. Horowitz has great stuff. We do have, for those of y'all that are interested in this kind of like model, I agree, by the way, you know, that depression is much more than taking a pill or managing your depression is much more than taking a pill. And especially if we look at someone who has treatment resistant depression, what does that mean? Treatment resistant? Does that mean that their depression is more severe than someone else's? That's what it implies, but not really. What treatment-resistant depression means is that the treatments don't work, which means one of two things. Either you are very, very sick, or we're treating the wrong thing. And in my overwhelming experience of working with people who have treatment-resistant depression, it is not that they are sicker than other people. It's that we are doing a bad job at how we approach the problem. We keep on throwing medications at the problem instead of solving the things that create this situation for them. Instead of teaching them things like coping skills, instead of teaching them how to find purpose in life. Because here's the crazy thing. Any difficult action that you take in life can be made easy if you've got a good reason to do it. So there are studies that show not studies, I'm looking at one study in particular, but other studies corroborate. That if you go to a social activity, the energy drain from the social activity correlates with, or inversely correlates with your purpose in being there. So if I've got no reason to be there, it's going to exhaust me. But if I have a reason to go, then suddenly I enjoy the social activity. So one of the biggest things that we miss in psychiatry is we go on throwing treatments at people without ignoring, while ignoring some of these basic things, which is that you have to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. When I have patients who are suicidal, you know what keeps them alive? It's not the SSRI. I mean, sometimes it is, maybe, but that's debatable. What keeps them alive is like the people in their life or the cats in their life. The number of patients who've been kept alive by their cat or dog is crazy. What keeps you from killing yourself? I'll just ask them that question. It sounds like your life is crap. They're like, well, if I killed myself, who would take care of my pets? I'm like, damn, that's crazy. That's what people say. And yet if that's what's keeping people alive, why don't we incorporate that into our treatment? We have it from the patient's mouth themselves. That this is what's keeping me alive. It's purpose. Number one thing that correlates with pornography addiction is meaninglessness. Everyone's talking about dopamine and people are also being judgmental and thinking that everyone's a pervert. That's why we're all addicted to porn. You got to have a reason not to watch porn. That's the antidote to watching porn. There are studies that show that overcoming an addiction requires the development of a competing interest. Anyone can be sober because other people want them to for a little while. Oh my God, I'm going through a divorce. My spouse is going to divorce me unless I stop drinking. And you can stop drinking for a while because the threat of that keeps you in line. But that's still a reason to stop drinking. And so developing things like purpose is critical for your mental health journey. So many studies, right? And the thing is, these are not the clinical trials. These are basic science studies. These are people when we're really, we're not just testing something. We're not taking a thousand people over here, a thousand people over there. We're homogenizing them and removing all of individuality. These are studies where you like sit down and you talk to human beings or you take a thousand people and you ask them what matters to you. And so if y'all are struggling with your mental health, it's really important that y'all start to think beyond some of this medical model. Because even within the medical model, we know that all this stuff is important. But this is not what our system of medicine has developed. Because it's hard to study. 
Do you all know why cognitive behavioral therapy is the first line treatment for so many mental problems? It's because it's the easiest to study. It's manualized. It's protocolized. There's a workbook. You do something on day one. You do something on day two. It is the thing that removes the most individuality from treatment, which makes it really easy to study. And the easier it is to study, the easier it is to have scientific evidence to support it. This is why medication, everyone loves medication trials. Because if you do a meditation trial, you're going to get screwed up because half of your people aren't going to meditate every day. If you do a trial on exercise, adherence rates are really low. But taking a pill is easy, which is why we have so many studies showing the effects of medication, because it's easy to do. Easiness bias, well said. That's the biggest bias in medicine. And the easier something is to study, the more evidence we'll have to support it. We can call that Dr. K's bias or Cherubin's bias. Credit where credit is due. And there's a great trial if you guys want to like hear about science for a second. One of my favorite trials is something called Step BD. It's this trial on bipolar disorder. And what I love about Step BD is it's something called a naturalistic study. So in a randomized controlled trial, what we do is we give this group of people medication. We give, let's say, this group of people placebo. And then we kind of like measure, you know, these people get paid to be in this trial. So they have to be adherent. We also do things like we measure their blood levels of the medication to make sure they're taking it. We do all kinds of artificial crap to make sure people take their medicine. And then we measure the result and the progress at the end. We force people to take it, incentivize people to take it, and then we measure the progress at the end. Step BD is a beautiful study because it's a naturalistic study, which means that we actually gave it to real people out in the world. We gave different medications. And we paid attention to how many of them stopped taking their medications because of things like side effects. And then we got a much better real-world impact of what this medicine is. Even if the medicine improves things by 50%, but if half the people stop taking it because of side effects, the actual result is a 25% increase across your population. But that's not how we do RCTs. In RCTs, we have complete, uh, close to, we do all kinds of things in the trial to artificially increase adherence. Let's put it that way. So I love this trial. I think we need to do more naturalistic studies. The problem is that they're very expensive. Okay, so if y'all want to learn more about all this stuff, like this perspective, that's what we have in Dr. K's Guide to Mental Health, right? It's this perspective. It's all the stuff that I think is important for mental health that is not actually a part of psychiatry. There is psychiatry in there just for the sake of rounding it out, right? So we'll explain, okay, how do you make a diagnosis? What are your treatment options? What are evidence-based treatments that you can talk to your doctor about? We have some, some of that stuff. But the whole point is it's not clinical. It's all the other stuff. In our guide to anxiety, for example, we have a video about thought loops. So this is not like something like, sure, maybe you can take a medication and it'll somehow numb you out and you'll experience fewer thought loops. But why do thought loops happen? How do you go about finding your purpose? Right? Because Dr. K is saying, oh, meaning matters in my life. Well, what do I do with that? And this is the shortcoming that we have in the research is you can do a study where you can ask 10,000 people what correlates the most with porn addiction. You can discover that meaninglessness correlates with porn addiction. But you don't have clinical trials on how do you help people find meaning. I mean, maybe you do. I haven't seen them. Because that's hard, right? How do you know if someone is doing it right? And if someone doesn't find their meaning at the end of it, does that mean that your methodology is bad or they didn't put forth the effort or the person who was delivering the intervention was bad? Like, how do you know? Because sometimes finding meaning is not generic then how do we study that in a population-based system? How do you study what individually works for people when you have a system of medicine that looks at populations? This is the weakness of evidence-based medicine. So someone came to me and said, Dr. K, will this medication help me? The honest answer is, I don't know. What I do know is that out of 10,000 people, this medication helped this percentage on average. That's what I know. But I have no idea if it's going to work for you. 
So if you all want to learn, if you like this perspective, definitely check out Dr. K's guide. A couple of other things. So we, uh, this is also stuff that we try to work on in group coaching. And I, I don't mean like depression and stuff, but the, the problem with group coaching is that people don't understand what they're signing up for because they're like, what am I going to get out of it? And that's exactly the problem is that we can't necessarily predict what you're going to get out of it because what you may need is different from what someone else may need. So we can't say you will get this particular thing. What we can say is that your life will get better. Right? For most people. Not everybody. That if you stick with it for a while, what it'll teach you is a way to connect with other people, to be vulnerable, to examine yourself. And then what yield you get from that depends. For some people, there's a benefit to accountability because everybody else in your group is doing something. They're doing the homework and you're not doing the homework. And so then you feel bad, so you're going to start doing the homework because you don't want to let these people down. And then the homework is on talking about your trauma or processing your trauma or something like that. And if that's what the homework's on, then you're going to you're gonna get that benefit. And so definitely check it out if y'all are interested. And the last thing is thank you and apologies for everything around the trauma workshop. We're running a trauma workshop at the end of the month. All the spots filled up within about 24 hours. We tried to increase the size a little bit, so we added a, a few more people, but we're capping it at that. And the reason we're capping it is because I want it to be a good educational experience for the people involved. And could we scale it more? Sure. But then it would degrade the quality for everybody else. So what I did is I, I took the scenarios in which I actually teach in real life, where at most I will have a lecture hall, right? There's like 200 to 300 people there. And if you give me eight hours to teach a course to 200 to 300 people in a lecture hall, that's pretty good. If it grows beyond that, then people's questions don't, you know, we don't have enough time for everybody's questions. And you may say, well, you're not asking, does that everybody get a question? No, it's because people usually share questions. So 200 to 300 people is like sort of like the max of what I've been able to teach at a time. And that's why our college classes are usually like that, right? So you'll have like 200 people in chemistry. Beyond that, it gets cumbersome and you, people start getting left behind. And so the challenge with that is that not everybody gets a spot, right? So we're sorry about that. And also thank you to everyone who signed up within like 24 hours. So that's crazy. So we've already recognized that we, we think we're onto something, but we want to actually run the workshop first, make sure that people like it and it's helpful. And if that's the case, then we'll run another one. Probably. Or we'll do it. I don't know exactly what we're doing. We're trying something new for the first time. And the basic problem is that we can teach you a lot about stuff, but how do you actually do it? What are the day-to-day -day things that you need to do? And this is the shortcoming of something like Twitch or YouTube, which is that if we have like an eight-hour video about everything you should do in your life, that no one's going to watch the video. <laughs> right? So it just doesn't work in that situation. What happens if one hour and 17 minutes in, someone's got a question because they didn't understand something? Well, screw you. We've got six hours and 43 minutes to go. So you just, and then over time, you're going to lose people over the course of the eight hours. So that's why we're trying to do it this way. And if y'all want to sign up, you can still sign up. There's a wait list. I, I don't know exactly what's happening with the wait list. Okay. Just in full transparency, but we're getting the wait list and our hope is to serve you in some way down the road. Okay. Awesome. So, can you speak of the false positives and non-publication of rep replication studies and journals? <laughs> sure, there's not much to say. So there's this thing called the publication bias, which is that if you do a study and you find nothing, it is hard to get it published. But if you do a study and you find something, it is easy to get it published or easier. So what that means is let's say I've got a treatment. Let's say that I say, okay, here is a note card. And sniffing a note card will improve your mental health. And I do a clinical trial where I take a note, I give 100 note cards to 100 people, and I say, sniff this, baby. Sniff away. And then does it improve their mental health? No. And then I try to publish a trial that says, sniffing note cards does not help with mental health. And the publisher's like, who the hell is going to read this? 
No one's going to read this. We know that sniffing note cards doesn't help. So it doesn't get published. Now, occasionally, there are things like statistical anomalies. There are things like placebo effects. There are things like research bias. Or straight up cheating. And someone does a clinical trial of sniffing note cards. And they discover that, oh my god. Sniffing note cards outperforms our best mental health treatment cures everybody in the trial and then you send that to a publisher in the new england journal of medicine or the lancet these top top journals are like holy crap this person has discovered the treatment of the century sniffing note cards cures mental health and they want to be the first ones to publish it so i was talking to someone who worked at the new england journal of medicine which is one of the best journals in the world and i asked them how do you all decide what to publish and they said, there, there are two things that we try to do. We try to be the first paper published on the topic and the last paper published on the topic. So if it's the discovery, we want it. If it's the thing that closes the book and gives the final answer on the topic, we want it. That's publication bias. And it's rife throughout medicine. And so if you kind of think about what's the implication of this, the implication is that there is a very good chance that things work less well than we think. Because we only publish the positive studies. Right? So that means that on average, people's belief that stuff works, that nothing in medicine works quite as well as we think it does because of this publication bias. And even today with like Dr. Horowitz, like that's what we saw, right? He's like, hey, by the way, there are all these studies, turns out, they're kind of BS. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm with him that I, I think he's right. And I, I really respect the dude, right? And I push him sometimes because that's what we got to do. But when he's like, there's a non-specific effect for SSRIs because it has like modest effects and all kinds of random crap that's completely biologically unrelated. That makes sense to me. Makes perfect sense to me. Does something weird like kind of numbs you out. So if antidepressants kind of numb you out, we can see how it won't cure depression, but it'll maybe make you feel better for a little while. We can see how if you've got premenstrual dysphoric disorder, where your mood, you get super depressed around before your period, right? And this is where a lot of people will be very, very, like, sexist and will say, like, oh, it's your time of the month again. I don't think people understand how bad PMDD or, for that matter, period pain is. Like, just because it happens every month doesn't mean that it doesn't suck. And it's kind of like, well, like, don't people get used to it? Well, I don't know, bro. If someone came and smacked you in the nuts every day for one week of the month, would you get used to it after a decade? For, so for some people, it's very crippling. And the other problem with sort of sexism around periods is that we're like, oh, you're like, you're emotional. Meh. Just because someone is emotional doesn't make them wrong. You all get that? Emotions don't mean you're wrong. Completely independent. But you're like, no, but I'm super logical. I'm not emotional. I'm logical. That makes me right. That's idiotic. Everyone's emotional all the time. You're just not aware of it. So the people that I know that think that they are not emotional and are being perfectly logical are the ones that oftentimes have the emotions pulling the puppet strings on their logic. And all you have to do is watch any political debate to see this in action. Both sides are completely convinced that I'm not emotional, I'm logical. And yet no one convinces someone else. And if, if I'm logical, then I'm right. And if I, my logic is correct, then you should believe me, right? That's how logic works. It's fact. Idiotic. So going back to SSRIs. So I think it's, it makes total sense that there's a non-specific numbing effect. So it kind of numbs us out if we're suicidal. It kind of numbs us out if we have fibromyalgia. It kind of numbs us out a little bit if we've got PMDD. 
And the other thing to remember is that the highest concentration, the two highest concentrations of serotonin in the body are in the brain and in the gut. And I don't know if y'all know this, but when it comes to menstruation, your uterine lining is shedding, literally dying. It's the only process in human physiology that is necrotic instead of apoptotic. That's natural. Maybe there's one more. Maybe there's one more. And for those of you that don't know what the difference is, there's something called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, which means the cell is like, hey, I don't need to be here anymore. This tissue does not belong in this place, so I'm going to pack everything up and then shut everything down. It's like shutting down. It's like moving out of the house. We're going to close everything up. We're going to cancel all, all of our utilities. We're going to pack everything in boxes. We're going to move it out in an orderly fashion. Necrosis is death from damage. So if I get, if a truck runs me over, the cell death that I experience is necrosis. And when women go through their period, it's necrosis. It is the cell death of damage. That's the difference between moving out of your house and burning it down. In both cases, the place is empty. But one hurts like hell and damages us a lot. And the second is like totally chill. And by the way, the webbing in your fingers, the you used to have webbing here, like we're amphibians or mutants or whatever. And, and the webbing between our fingers dies by apoptosis. That's how we end up with fingers instead of webbing. Programmed cell death. It's cells that are supposed to die. So take it easy on people who have their periods. And for those of y'all that have really bad periods, like my condolences to you. And also like, it's not your fault and it just kind of sucks. And that's how biology works. Hopefully you can get some compassion from the people around you. Yeah, it's awful. Right? But we got to like understand, like as dudes, we got to understand this stuff too. We got to understand, like, just because we don't go through it doesn't mean that we should minimize it. And it doesn't mean we have a frame of reference. Right? Does that make sense? Like, we just don't have anything like that equivalently. <laughs> Someone's asking, how do you taper off Prozac? Well... Mark Horowitz would say that you do a hyperbolic taper, which apparently is what the UK guidelines say now too. But I would say talk to your doctor about it and maybe ask them about some of this stuff. So encourage your doctor to read up on this stuff instead of assuming that this is the way to do it, right? And then what I would do is like trust your doctor. Ask them to like do a thorough analysis of the evidence, which I think is good to ask your doctor to do. I don't mind when patients ask me to do that, by the way. And like, I think it's okay. Like I learned something. It makes me a better doctor to do my homework. So Sarah is saying for Prozac, it's extra slow. So the real irony here is that for Prozac, the common wisdom amongst most medical professionals is it's the easiest to come off of because it has such a long half-life. Wouldn't that also apply to when men get angry from our testosterone? We usually show emotion through anger. So let's understand a couple things. When men get angry, I don't know that it is through your testosterone or that testosterone is to be blamed unless you're on something like anabolic steroids or things like that that can cause anger. We should absolutely be compassionate towards men who get angry. This is one of the biggest tragedies in society is when other people get emotional, we have compassion towards them, right? So if someone starts crying, we don't say, screw you, shut the hell up. Or if people do, we call that toxic. Now, the problem is that different human beings respond to stresses in different ways. And so if I fail a test, some people cry and some people get angry. And men especially, we're conditioned to only be allowed to experience one emotion. I'm not allowed to cry. I'm not allowed to be shamed. 
I'm certainly not allowed to be scared. What? Literally the word that we use to describe someone who is scared, who's a man, usually, is the word. It's a synonym for the female vagina that is also the word for a cat. And that's what we call men. We demasculinize them if they experience fear. Right? I don't know if I can say this, but we call them pussies. That's in our language. There is shaming of men for experiencing anything except for anger. And then when men don't know how to express anything except for anger, this is the only thing that we know how to express. And then we get demonized for it. It's okay for you to be afraid for a job interview. It's okay for you to feel ashamed by someone else. There's compassion for that. It's okay for you to be sad. But the one thing that we don't allow people to do is feel angry. That makes you a bad person, and especially a bad man. Look at that crazy, dangerous man. He's angry. That guy needs to be put in jail. So we should absolutely be more compassionate towards the expression of negative emotion. And we need to understand that different people experience stress and negative emotion in different ways. And some of those are more societally acceptable than others. And people may say, but that's because some are better than others. I disagree. I think this is part of our societal bias as well. That we preferentially demonize the emotional experiences of men. And there, there are cases where we do this with women as well. Like we just talked about menstruation as an example. That is a preferential and focused devaluation of the experience of women. Women get it in a different way. It's that if you are emotional, I'm not going to take you seriously. And when things matter to us the most, that's when we get emotional. So it's so damaging because this thing is important to me. And the one thing that you're going to do is invalidate it. The more I care about it, the more you're going to crap on me. And we wonder why there's a mental health crisis in this world. Right? Everybody's screwed. We're all just screwed in different ways. And there's no value in comparing how screwed people are. Men are more screwed than well. Like, that dynamic needs to stop. That dynamic is half the problem. Getting screwed is not a competition. It's a co-op game. And here we are playing versus. So for all y'all who hear about the problems that someone else is facing and you say, but I have it worse. That resentment is exactly what got us here. Because someone is saying, hey, my life is hard. And you're saying, screw you, I have it worse. And then when you say, my life is hard, because I hear a lot of men complain about when I, compl like, I'm not allowed to complain. I have it worse, right? And what's happening there? There's like people on the other side of the table, sometimes women, who are saying, screw you. You're part of the patriarchy. You don't, you don't get to complain. And so the invalidation of complaints is the problem. It's not the gender that's the problem. It's the behavior. My experience as a psychiatrist, there can be assholes who are men, women, or non-binary. Assholes of all shapes and sizes. Right? And the problem is that, especially on the internet, some of them float to the surface. Okay. I think we're done for the day. We ran an hour long. Love y'all. Thank you very much for coming. Huge shout out to Dr. Horowitz for doing this awesome work. I mean, this guy could, in conjunction with his colleagues, revolutionize the way that we consider psychiatry and really change the way that we practice, which I think is awesome. And I can't wait to see those clinical trials because that's, you know, we still got to see that and see what happens. Um, yeah. This is church. <laughs> the sermon has ended. So thank you all very much. Um, you know, thank you to everyone who signed up for the trauma workshop. There's an uh, there's a command in chat for those of you all to join the wait list. And we'll do something, right? We're going to figure something out. I don't know exactly what. Uh, so sign up for the wait list if you all are interested. This is new for us, so we weren't expecting it to fill up in like one day or eight hours or nine hours or what, however long it took. So that was not, we were not expecting that. But thank you very much. We're going to do our best to live up to your expectations and help you in a substantial and concrete way.
We have group coaching spots available, so check those out. And if y'all are interested in more perspectives on mental health that are a little bit more in-depth, definitely check out Dr. K's guide. And, you know, maybe check out Dr. Horowitz's clinic. Who knows? It sounds like it's coming to California sometime in 2024. So thank you to everyone for coming today. Take care of yourselves.